Casper. That's nice to know. Uh, yeah, I'm Casper. I'm a third year PhD student uh, based at King's, um, supervised by Andrew Reeder, uh, doing PETS and PETS MR image reconstruction, mostly focused on post processing and uh, sort of like image denoising and that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Nikos Eftimir from the University of Cal. <coughs> I'm a researcher of, on uh, PET image reconstruction, and I'm a still developer, and more recently, surf developer. <laughs> uh, Evgeny Avchenikov, STFC, software developer, and CC PET MR project manager. Um, I'm Harry Tinklin. I'm a first-year PhD student at the University of Leeds, working in I'm an undergraduate from Germany, and currently work with Harry at the University of Leeds. Uh, I'm Richard Brown, uh, postdoc at UCL, working with Chris, uh, working on the answer in this as an art project. I'm uh, Harry Chubas uh, from the University of Leeds, and uh, I'm working with a uh, steer, and I'm not surfing yet, but hopefully we'll make it. <laughs> I'm Alex. Uh, I'm at UCL. I'm doing a PhD with Chris in respiratory motion correction for PET CT. I'm Jen Pardell. I'm at SDSC in the CCPI group, so that's Donald Brown Imaging. All right. Thank you. So I think that's everybody from the room here. So if I sort of do it in order of participants as they are here, so I guess that's uh, uh, Oli Gators. Yes, uh, so I've been working with uh, PET and STIR for the last two years in Stockholm. And I visited uh, Chris in London uh, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, hello. So here I am Eduardo Pasca. I'm a core developer of CCP Petama at and CCPI with Gemma, and I'm based at RAL, so at, uh, in Oxfordshire. Uh, here, so we we are here as AVF RAL. So we have one other person. Uh, hello, my name is Melanie, and I'm working for Diamond, um, which is well on the STFC site, but separate company. Um, I've been playing with machine learning stuff for a few years, and I'm just a nosy about what you're doing. Okay, well, I see Ben there. Uh, ben, I don't think you have a microphone either. If so, this is uh, Ben Thomas from UCL, one of our postdocs, has been setting up a zoo and things for us to pay this for during the actual letter. Um, see Simon. Yes, hi, it's Simon Irish from UCL. I work with the rest of his team on aspects of SMR, especially in learning aspects at the moment. Okay. Martin. Good morning, just joined and I'm not hearing what you just said beforehand, but I'm interested to see how it all compares and contrasts with the machine learning version that CCPI did. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we've skipped uh, Christopher. Yes, um, so I'm a PhD student from Germany and I'm looking into how you can connect CT reconstruction algorithms with neural networks or with TensorFlow and PyTorch especially. Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh... Chris, before you go on, there is a little window on, on top of the... Yes, that thing, just on top of the slide. I don't know if you can remove it. Good. So uh, I just thought it would be useful to, to give a brief overview of where we are with SURF, but I, I, I try and keep that really short. Um, but also because there are some people here who have never joined us before that we get 
maybe a bit of a flavor. I, I, I don't have the normal slides on telling you what surf is. Maybe maybe I should have. But um, anyway, so, so that then we're going to our four talks uh, on machine learning and image reconstruction by all our invited people. And then uh, we have a brief information on future activities that we are organizing. And then uh, have a discussion on our long-term plan that we have if it should be modified and where we are and when, when we might have our next release and things like that. Uh, so let me just uh, go with, uh, so these are slides prepared earlier, but this one is by opinion, but I, I'll try and go through it rather quickly myself. So the, um, we're at our second release of our synergistic construction framework. For those who don't know, it tries to tie up gadgets from 4MR, STIR for pet reconstruction, and Nifty Reg for image registration into one C++ framework with MATLAB and uh, Python interfaces towards it. And so uh, we, we have, uh, initially it was all, uh, all the interfacing Python and MATLAB side, but so we've, we've made more progress towards doing that on the C++ side now recently, and that would then uh, provide us with an, an API for people to use it on C++ level, which is uh, what uh, some people are doing now. Um, uh, so we also have work in progress, uh, which maybe we could have discussed in the plan, but I put it here just to give you a feel for it. So uh, CCPI has an independent originally effort on a core imaging library and we're trying to integrate the two such that uh, they are compatible on the Python level and we can call uh, CIL algorithms using surf objects and, and projectors and things like that. And so uh, that is about ready to be merged uh, right now. So there's some technical details there, which I think is maybe not so important because half of it has been resolved by now already anyway. Um, so th there are a lot of uh, advanced regularizers and reconstruction algorithms or optimization algorithms, I should say, in CIL. And so we can use those for, for that or MR reconstruction. Um, then on the number of projects have been working on, on the STIR site as well. So this is just a summary on where we are uh, on the G-Signals slide from Palak in, uh, about three weeks ago. So it might, might have advanced in the meantime again as well. But um, so she has sort of slowly grinded away at all these things which are, are very painful, but uh, she keeps on going. So that's fantastic. And uh, the normalization effort there, I think she can already do it outside, but she's now integrating it in, into the, the normal stone normalization classes and once that's done, again, you can pick it up really easily on the search side. Uh, so she's made a lot of effort on time of flight validation on that recently, so that's all great. Um, so here are some examples that she sent to me. Uh, that's just a listing of time of flight bits with a reconstruction toolbox from GE versus uh, STIR, so that's identical. And then some reconstructed images, which are uh, K and G ones are still doing better, but we're getting closer. So uh, it's all fantastic, I think. Um, and we had some discussion recently by emails on what about the MR side, and that's a bit uh, more depressing in a way, uh, so that there is a converter from G uh, available open source to go from GE's uh, HDF5 file format to, well, they have two different file formats anyway, to ISMRMRD, which is what we need for a gadget from. And that's done by people in NIH, and this is sort of what they uh, wrote in emails to Julian and, and David. Uh, essentially saying for basic sequences, this is fine, but if you, if you do anything more advanced, then the converter doesn't exist. 
uh, and that's um, that is a problem. And they say, well, you feel free to write it yourself. But, um, <laughs> might not be so easy, I guess. So, uh, uh, in particular, they say Siemens has it sort of has a description of the sequence, but GE doesn't do that. So you need to know what the sequence is for it to help it. Um, but nevertheless, the first bits are done, so we, we hope in the not too distant future to try and reconstruct our first MR data from GE. And then a few slides from uh, Johannes Meyer from uh, Berlin, um, who is developing a simulation framework for dynamic data uh, for PET-MR. And this is uh, all in progress and accessible, has been presented by SMRM. And so uh, at the moment it's based on XCAT simulations, but if you have any other objects together with motion fields, that could work as well. Um, and so, so there is something that needs to um, give you the images and the motion with them, what he does is uh, if you have surrogates for this, you will combine them all up and then do the four projections using the surf objects and then do the reconstruction separately as well. And so here are some examples of cardiac and respiratory motion, both on PET and MR side. He's showing that you can get artifacts in the MR images depending on how your sequence works. So that's what he wants to use this tool for and then to see how the uh, the sequence that they are developing, uh, what the motion artifacts are, and then this motion correction, how well does that will work. So that could be a hugely useful tool, and we might try during the hackathon, might try and play around with that to generate ourselves some data, although Johannes said it's not going to work because the only person who's ever tried it is me. So, uh, this is <laughs> um, Oh yeah, these are some example results that he that he has where he puts the motion into uh, no where he does image post uh, registration, but he's uh, one of his research topics is to try and combine registration for both PET and MR, so he can do all of that now. So, um, so uh, other bits on stir. So uh, stir has gather, but uh, that's been moved so that there's a bunch of scripts to call it at the moment and because has been moving that to C++ side and uh, has integrated that into surf so you can call it from surf if you are on a particular branch. Um, I'll show you a result in the next slide so that there's still a few problems to sort out there but I think this is so whenever Nikos gets some time to look at that. Uh, so that means if we don't ask him to organize a hackathon plan uh, or a software meeting, uh, it should be merged. Uh, I don't know, whatever. He's not here, so I'm not going to give him any deadlines. Um, he's also been working on the time of flight branch. That's been a, a bit stuck now because I pushed him to try and do the scatter first for the for the cert paper that we have. Um, some work on multi bed positions and LPS coordinates uh, that has been stuck for a while now as well, because Ashley is committed his PhD and is uh, on another project that he tries to pick it up. Um, we have HKM ready for merging, I think. Uh, I think that that is done essentially. And then we have some other people in, in Zurich, uh, ETH, who have implemented this third extension to handle block detectors, not just the intricate scanning. Um, and I hope that we can get that contributed at some point, and that is waiting for me. So all of these things will extend stir, sorry, stir and therefore stir, I think, considerably in as far as functionality goes. Uh, Alex has looked at, together with your team, uh, we can call on a branch called the time of flight stuff from stir to there. So that, that needed very few modifications also. That's great. Yeah. It's really great. Uh, I, I wonder how much effort it would take for uh, merging things. 
it sounds a bit quite nice, but I feel like the difficulties is when uh, we do, for example, include time of flight, then probably the block detector with time of flight may I'm not sure how. Yeah, I I've never I've never seen the code for, for, for or, or HTML. And, yeah, but it's it's great to. So I don't okay. So I I don't think this is a major problem because the way that we organized it. So uh, HKM doesn't care what your data is. It just needs to have a reconstructor. And it can be some of flight data or whatever CD data. It doesn't it doesn't really care. So don't think that much will have any influence. Uh, the time of flight. Thing, the way that we set it up was that the, uh, you give it a normal non-time of flight projector and it will then add the time of flight information on top of it, which is a bit inefficient uh, in computation time, but it's very efficient in programming time. <laughs> because if you then get your raw detectors, with any luck it will just work, but in fact it works. So I, don't, I don't think it's a major, uh, a major issue. They're relatively new. Uh, I know some of these are there for a long time. There's, there's various reasons for that. Uh, but the most important reason is that I will only occasionally find fun to leave you with. And so anybody who can give comments to this uh, pull request would be very, very welcome to help. Um, nobody that the people who contribute will actually don't have time either. So you know, it's kind of difficult. Okay, that's just uh, an example of the surf reconstruction of a cardiac data set from uh, Christoph Kolmich, well, actually, from Kings, uh, reconstructed with the MMR and with SERP. And so, okay, well, on the projector, they look identical, but they actually don't. So then there's probably still a few problems on, on the status side. We do normally better than this, but uh, it's very close. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a feel of what surface may be very briefly, and then what things are, are coming up uh, from the external project uh, type of things as opposed to our own development in SERP. That's for discussion as well. Um, any questions at this point? Or remarks, suggestions? No. Uh, in that case, I'll uh, start with uh, introducing, well, introducing Casper. Uh, okay, uh, you've heard him already, he's a PhD with Andrew Reader. And so the, the next few talks, uh, so I asked all four speakers to, to sort of uh, not really give the lowdown on the scientific machine learning aspect and so on, because, uh, well, that's obviously very important, but you can go to a conference and that, but what usually people don't talk about is how do I increment stuff, and which kind of software do I use, and so on. And that's what we are interested in because we want to implement it ourselves. And so I've asked everybody to to uh, give a bit more detail on that. So uh, maybe I should try and minimize the screen there. Are you going to screen share? Or yeah, are you going to? I think I should be able to. Okay, so I'll the process. Right. Um, some comics there, which you might be able to see. Uh, the slides are going to be available online as well. Um, there's a lot of content in here, and you probably want to go through it and copy paste code. Um, so yes, yeah. Uh, the point of this talk is just going to be basically how to install uh, Surf and, for example, NiftyPad because it has GPU constructors, which may projectors, which maybe might be included in Surf at some point in the future. Um, and a simple example of Keras as well. And focus mainly on Ubuntu, but you should be able to do similar things in perhaps Windows. 
Um, okay, so first off, quick run through hardware requirements, uh, GPUs, um, then onto software, starting with the operating system level, and then you know low-level packages, and then, and then finally a MATLAB or Python wrapper. <coughs> Um, in terms of machine learning, Python, I think, is preferable to MATLAB, though MATLAB does assert that they do machine learning better than everyone else, which is typical MATLAB. So. Anyway, um, yeah, so when it comes to hardware, uh, in terms of using CPU only, it's, it's going to be orders of magnitude slower, both when it comes to forward and back projectors and also anything to do with machine learning, really. Um, depending, of course, on how optimized you write your CPU code, it, it might not actually be that much slower running things on the CPU. Um, the problem with uh, hardware, though, is that NVIDIA is only the, really the only player when it comes to GPUs. There are other manufacturers who are basically less interested in the scientific community, let's say. Um, so there's, there's just much more uptake of CUDA, which is tied to NVIDIA. So CUDA is a software which is developed by NVIDIA for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, the other limitation when, when it comes to hardware is the amount of memory which is on your GPU. So while you might have you know, half a terabyte of RAM in your computer, you can't actually have a neural network that size. There's, you're limited by the amount of uh, memory in your GPUs. OK, um, in terms of software, um, it's a lot easier to use Linux to install things. App get installed. Um, and also, the other nice thing with Linux is that you can use NVIDIA Docker. So Docker is this kind of replacement for virtual machines. Um, and it allows you, NVIDIA Docker allows you to use your graphics card inside your containers, your Docker containers. Whereas in Windows, it's a little harder to get um, GPU support for the virtual machine. And of course, it can be annoying to install things you might have to go to get the website. Anyway, okay, so in terms of the low level stuff, which is happening behind the scenes when you install Surf or, or Keras or whatever, um, you have C++ and, and C code, which you ideally never need to touch or, or write in, uh, CUDA as well, which is uh, sort of abstraction of C++. And all of that is kind of handled by Surf and MiftyPed and TensorFlow. And they wrap these low-level languages in something which is high-level, which you can, uh, well, more human-readable, uh, user-friendly, and basically Whenever you want to run a function that might take a long time to run, it actually internally will call some C++ or CUDA code. Uh, so Surf provides a MATLAB um, wrapper or API. Um, and then everything, including Surf, provides Python APIs. OK, so installation, fun times. Um, first up, GPU drivers. So this is for Ubuntu 18. As it says, perhaps. Oh, yep, I do have a mouse. Yep, so this is for Ubuntu 18. Uh, you'll need a different uh, link, of course, if it's a different version. And it's specifically also CUDA 10.0, which is what TensorFlow currently recommends, though I think 10.1 and 10.2 will work. Uh, so it's annoying you have to keep track of these kind of things and your dependencies and what version of CUDA they need. Are different ages of GPUs capable of running different versions of CUDA, something like that? Uh, so, the CUDA toolkit is different from the runtime. Um, so the, the CUDA toolkit is just the, uh, basically the libraries, but the runtime, which is going to be a graphics driver, will be installed automatically when you install CUDA. And ideally, it should automatically detect based on your GPU what runtime it should install. So hopefully, you get the correct drivers for your GPU. Okay. Um, NVIDIA's got a lot better at this over recent years, but it used to be the case that if you install this and you reboot your computer, you might be left with a, a, like a black screen and just a terminal, in which case you'll have to sudo app get uninstall NVIDIA um, and, and yeah, try again, basically. Um, yeah, so. Casper, Casper, sorry, Edo here. Just for me, so CUDA toolkit is kind of the compiler libraries and stuff which have different versions. And then you have the, the kernel modules to be able to run things on GPU, right? So you could run uh, software compiled with CUDA 7 on, on the same driver, with respect to CUDA 10. So you, can, you can install multiple versions of the CUDA toolkit. And um, yeah, they should run on the same driver, I think. Um, but I mean, there might be issues if it's a really old version of CUDA, it might not. 
But um, the, the only annoying thing with installing multiple versions of CUDA is that you have to make sure that the LD library path or whatever is correctly set for whatever program you're running. Okay, thank you. But yeah, no, you can install multiple versions of CUDA at the same time. Uh, okay, yeah, so that's CUDA installation for Windows 18. Um, annoyingly, CUDNN, which is a useful extra library, which is useful for most kind of machine learning, neural network type stuff, um, has to be downloaded separately, technically, so you can sign up for a free NVIDIA account if you go to that link, um, and then you get the download links, or you just copy paste the download link from online because they're not, I mean, they're publicly accessible links. Anyway, technically they want you to sign up to get the download link. Uh, Things are usually automatically added to your path, so you can find the binaries, but not necessarily your LD library path. So in order to find the libraries rather than just the binaries, you might have to append for that as well. Um, in terms of CMake, if you're using Ubuntu 18, you're fine. If you're using Ubuntu 16, you'll have to actually download CMake from the website in order to get the correct version to install Surf, because Surf requires uh, CMake 3.10. Um, yes, is fairly easy to install, app get install it, or follow the link if you're in Windows. Um, there are lots of app get dependencies uh, for Surf, which are completely optional. Uh, the super build should automatically download them, but it's, it's just quicker if you, if you install them yourself. Uh, in terms of Python, I'm using Mini Conda, which is like a stripped down version of Conda. Conda itself is a nice way to install and manage Python environment. Okay, so here again is how you would download QDNM for Ubuntu 18, assuming we did a toolkit 10.0. There we go. Um, annoying thing with some libraries is that they're not already in the default location. So QPTI is in a different library location, so you might have to add that to the path. Um, this is me just adding it to the bash RC file to make sure that it happens every time I log in and also in the current terminal explicitly. Okay. Well, Okay, um, extra dependencies, all of this stuff is mostly optional. Uh, pretty much all of this stuff is optional, the other stuff is required. Um, so you really only just need a way to uh, compile C++ code for Visual Studio or G++ or something, make um, basic Python development libraries, and that's about it, really, that's required. Okay. Uh, Minicon is nice, uh, just get the shell script, install it, done. No problem, you have full Python installation now. Okay. I create a separate Python environment just so that it doesn't mess with your other Python packages and install TensorFlow GPU and Keras and as well as build and install Nifty Python Server. So, creating a new Conda environment, that's, that's the syntax for creating a new environment called Surf. Uh, Conda Forge is just a repository which tends to be more up to date than Conda default repositories. Um, I'm specifying Python version 2 because even though it's kind of approaching end of life, it's, it's more supported by TensorFlow and uh, it's, TensorFlow should support Python 3, but for now I'm just leaving a Python 3 support no issues. Uh, just some basic stuff. The second line is just installing a Jupyter server, so notebooks, um, if that's the sort of thing you want to install, Spider instead if you want. Um, make sure that you activate your Conda environments if you are using Conda, so it's very common to be stuck in a different environment than the one you're trying to use, so you have to um, Nice thing about PIP is that you can install directly from GitHub repository, so uh, just installing ISO D tools, PIP install TensorFlow GPU. You can Conda install TensorFlow GPU, though it'll take longer and install packages which you probably already have in your computer. Um, Nifty Pet. These two lines are optional, just to stop it from prompting you where to find things. So NiftyPet will actually download uh, some tools, like basic registration kind of stuff, um, and this is so part of this is just the folder where it's going to download them. Um, whereas these MMR hardware maps folder, that's something which you have to specify. So it could be empty if you don't have them. Basically, Siemens. Uh, ships hardware attenuation maps, which are kind of proprietary, um, and you have to have them yourself. You can't ship them with Nifty Pet because it's proprietary. Uh, so actually, I, I have a letter from Siemens Sun that we can execute the hardware. Also, cool. In which case, it's going to be included in Nifty Pet soon. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so annoying pip command to install this stuff is an extra on 
something that's like no binary, but yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, this should build CUDA um, libraries specifically for that pet, depending on your drivers and CUDA versions, and it should all work. Uh, it takes a while to build, but whatever. Same thing for surf. So this is cloning the surf super code repository, which basically will handle download the surf and any possible dependencies. Um, a whole bunch of these command line arguments are just optional. So I'm specifying new system boost and armadillo, whatever, because I app get install all of those. Um, if you don't app get install of them and you don't include all of these flags telling Superbuild to use your system versions, it will just download it on the first. It just takes longer, but yeah, up to you. Um, Multi-threaded building supported as well. Okay, and finally, yay, we can actually do some surf. Um, but we need data. So there's data available here from Nifty Pets, which is just a single 16 minutes um, floor better pair list mode data file um, on the Siemens scanner. Uh, includes normalization in UT and new maps, but uh, doesn't have the hardware maps, of course. So you don't need them to reconstruct. Uh, you can also clone the SERP exercises repository and run the download scripts to potentially get some more data. I haven't really looked into that data. Um, you could use BrainWeb, which is this Python package I made, just to make it easy to download uh, BrainWeb phantoms and modify them to be a little more realistic kind of ground truths. Um, so F18 uh, intensities with a little bit of random structural uh, variations so it's not like piecewise constant. Um, yeah, way to add lesions and, and display volumes in Jupyter Notebooks as well. So now we can actually code now that we have data. Uh, so that's starting Jupyter Notebook, which is basically what I'm running right now. Um, bunch of imports, so there we go, we're importing TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow actually ships with Keras as an API, though there are different backends for Keras as well, if you prefer um, something else. Uh, this is Nifty Pads, and I don't really think I need to mention anything else here. Yeah, no, that's just getting the default scanner parameters. Apparently, NiftyPad should be able to support things which are not seen as MMR uh, dimensions, but I haven't tested it. OK. Uh, yeah, so here's some very much data. This is just the raw data uh, obtained. I think this is patient number 54, according to brain web numbering. Um, should be able to slice the volumes. Run, maybe possibly. Yay, slicing through. Cool. Um, so convert this to SDG like intensities. Um, that single function is there. Uh, add some randomly spaced lesions as well. Are we? There we go. Okay, so like lesion is there. This is meant to be SDG like intensities. Uh, there's an EMAP T1 and T2 images. And we can simulate reconstruction now. So simple reconstruction, 100 million counts, 30% randoms. Uh, that would be the nifty pet function, which actually does that for you. I've added some resolution modeling type. Uh, well. Yeah, no, it is, it is, yeah, Gaussian blurring in image space, 4.5 millimeters. I should have had an equation at some point demonstrating this. Why isn't my equation short? Oh well, pity. Never mind. Um, yeah, added some randoms, 30%. And that's what the sinograms look like. Uh, so that is the trues, that's randoms. And there should be some random variation in there as well. Attenuation, sinogram, and then this is the overall once you add everything together and add, have a plus and minus realization. Okay, there we go. Finally, the equation. Awesome. Um, so this is all that I'm really showing over here, symbol MLEM. So that's M is the measure data. Um, I've got image space Gaussian blurring, H, uh, X, that's the matrix, A, attenuation. I've just added randoms over here. You could just scatter this as well, and if that does support that. Um, yeah, and this is simple MLEM. Hopefully it makes sense. Uh, and this would be how you would do that. Just pretty confusing some things, attenuation and normalization. Um, a mask array, so this is basically just the center of field of view of the scanner. scanner. Uh, in case you wonder what that is. And that is MLEM. So some results. Top left is the ground truth, and these are just as MLEM iterations increase. I just 
and, and integrations with Emilio. Uh, and then some machine learning. So I've included really basic code, just the 2D UNET model, which tries to map your final MLAM iteration back to the ground truth, really. That's all it's trying to do. Um, four con layers and four off something layers. So this is the uh, Keras code to do that. And hopefully, yeah, so if I print a summary of the model, this is the kind of thing that Keras will give you in terms of debugging. Um, this goes on. Uh, I terminated training earlier over here of this 128 epochs, but whatever. Hopefully, you have results at some point. There we go. Yeah. So on the left is final information of MLEM. Um, far right is the grand truth, and the middle is the units prediction. You know about it? No, no, it's fine. Yeah, no, they don't. I'm going to blame early termination and also a really simple. But I think it looks it looks too good. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's just because it was a really simple basic model. Oh. You could definitely do something which will work a lot more. So, yeah. Indeed. Kasper, you haven't run it now, right? I, I, I did actually run it right now. Okay. Really? Yeah, there we go. Running. I mean, I'm not going to wait another seven minutes for that to finish, but you get the idea. So, okay. No, 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 no. Uh, so the picture is for a full training, which are, you didn't finish. Yeah, that picture was the what, 120 epochs with this really basic unit. Okay. Yeah. So the result of the training will be the image that we just saw. Yes. Or then you have to something because you're training your model and then you yeah so to... you train the model uh, where is it fit inputs and targets so you specify what your input is which is in my case last iteration of MLM and uh, target would be the uh, would have been the ground truth oh yeah because I'm running my GPU at 100 percent that works okay yeah so you you specify what you're fitting to and once the model is trained you just run the model of predict on any input that you want so long as that input is the same shape as the training is though it should be able to in make an inference, basically. Uh, sorry, um, so I thought you were training your model to do from your first iteration to your 10th iteration. So no, no, I'm, I'm training the model to try and get the ground truth so go um, in this case. But I mean, you can do whatever you want. Really. You can try and train your model to skip MLM iterations. Or, yeah. So, um, input images? Oh, this is the basic thing where I think I'm also missing the crime sense that I'm trying to predict based on the training data as well. So, yeah. But what are those? What are the I, I think all that I did here was entire. Yeah. So I took an entire 3D volume of one single reconstruction and sliced it up into many 2D slices in the Z direction. Oh, okay. Um, and just treated those 2D slices into separate regions to the network. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And could you, could you do something else? Take the sign of them to take the view graphs for the sign of them and then train based on that yes. and then predict the reconstructed view graphs. You could try and directly go from a sinogram to a reconstructed image. There, there have been some papers trying to do this like auto map. Okay. The problem is they're not particularly, a, a neural network isn't particularly well suited to it because um, if you think about a, a, well, a sinogram, um, you have pixels going all the way across your entire sinogram, which will affect one single other pixel. So in terms of the convolutional filter, which can deal with the sinogram, it would have to have a really large kernel size, right. um, which isn't great for neural networks because that means you know, massive network size for large training time. So you need dense layers to deal with that problem. What, what do you mean dense layers? What, what, dense as in every single input pixel could affect every single output pixel. Right. Whereas right now, if you're working in only an image space, you could have convolution kernels which are like three by three tiny little small things. They don't have to look at the entirety of the image. So denoise. But, but what about the Hagstrom paper, which uses a convolutional encoder decoder from a 2D sinogram to a reconstructed image? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there, there are papers out there which, which try to do this. Do you do that using just uh, downsampling via multiple convolutional encoding layers? Yeah. 
face and then a generation out to the reconstructed image. So I think it is okay because, you know, those compact kernels, if you do enough layers, then you can reach all kinds of parts of the image. So. Yeah. And there's, there's also, you could um, just work in sinogram space as well. So try and clean up your sinograms directly. Um, and then use another reconstruction. Can I ask Edo here again? How big is your uh, data then? So you have 512 cube or something? Uh, data of. Let's do this. Targets. Ah. No completion shape. Oh, my thing is still running. That's why. That's why it's. Uh, <laughs> Yes, one, one question uh, while this is running. Yeah. Uh, you have your construction the image, then if you, in your ground truth remove the, the, the lesion, yeah. what would be the result? So you have your input which has the lesion there, but yeah. it's very clear, and then your ground truth doesn't have the lesion, it's just a map of the brain. I mean, this is a really stupid basic model, like I don't recommend using this model, but yeah, I mean, you should be able to create a model which will remove lesions, if you like. Yeah? Oh, it sounds kind of feasible. Yeah. My, but my question is that if, if you train based on the, a library of patients, yeah. then these patients will have lesions in different places. You cannot use the information of the lesions to train the model, but you would like it to be able to perform for some arbitrary lesion of, of yeah. some patient. Well, okay, I, I don't know if this kind of relates to your question, but in, in practice it's also hard to deal with lesions, networks tend to suppress them because right. there's very few cases where there is a lesion, it's just going to think it's noise. Right. Um, it's a lot harder to actually get the lesion coming through. So in, in this case, it's probably going to suppress it anyway. Um, and if you try and kind of force it to have lesions coming through, then you're going to get lots of false positives as well. Right? Mm -hmm. It takes noise for lesion. But yeah, no, you should be able to do weird sort of tasks like that where you remove well, just like you remove artifacts, you can also try and remove lesions. Yeah. So, Casper, again, about the data size. So, you have 127 images in total. Yes, so this is actually a single 3D volume, but then I'm, I'm treating all of the different, in the Z direction, I'm treating it as just different slices. How do so, you end up with 1,000? I don't have 1,000 at any point. I just have 1,000 epochs. I'm just, like, iterating through the network 1,000 times or whatever it was. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah. I only have 127 images of the same patient. So but this is this kind of a toy model, right? Because yeah. you, you, you won't be able to use it on a different brain. Or will it? Um, well, yes, you will. But you probably will be able to use it on another brain where based brain develop, um, generated exactly the same way. They're going to be very similar. Um, yeah, sure. Not on my brain. It's just that we are surprised here that the data set is small. Well, it's an illustration of how to get how to connect up all the yeah all the software components and then yeah then the science starts. So I, guess. I I definitely do not recommend using this as a base for actual serious research. No, you would you would do um. Well, there's, there's lots of things you can do, go down here. So I think I have a final slide about future potential directions. Yeah, okay, so you could do post-processing going from like, as I showed above, um, kind of a low count reconstruction to the ground truth if you have simulated ground truths. Um, or you could go from a low dose to full dose sort of thing. You could do that with real data as well. You could use MR as an additional input as well. Uh, there's these papers, um, well, actually it's just one idea really, which is using uh, machine learning inside the uh, MLA and iteration kind of algorithm. So you use uh, network trained per iteration, thing, which is pretty nice. Slides are available online, and there's also a paper pending, I think. An yeah. Okay. Potentially something to hack on. Yeah, hack on. Right. Exactly. I think that's, that's really great for a start for a practical uh, getting going with this stuff as opposed to just hearing this and say, oh, I have unit for every one, you know how to create one. Yeah, so yeah. Thanks, Casper. It's really good. I think we do have to uh, move to our 
next speaker, which so I guess you need to stop sharing. Well, you already did. Uh, I, I see Olivier raised hand. Then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I raised my hand. Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead, Olivier. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, hi everyone. First of all, the, my name is Verd, Ver, Verdier. If that's oh, I'm sorry. Yes. If, yes. Just, just, just for the record. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, also, it turns out I took uh, improvised holidays. So I'm in holiday right now, so I, I don't really have a. I don't. Pre I didn't prepare slides, for instance, but I'm going to 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 explain the architecture anyway. Hope it's okay. Yeah, sure. So. Um, First of all, a few comments on, on the previous uh, previous uh, speaker. So I would definitely advise against uh, installing Python 2 ever. I think unless you have a very, very good reason, you should really stick to Python 3 in general. That's my recommendation, at least. Uh, the second uh, comment, this is why I raised my hand uh, earlier. Uh, uh, another comment is about someone asked a question about uh, using neural network on sinograms, right? Yep. So I th we we did experiment with that, and that's uh, that actually it it can it can work at least in two D. There are at least two problems with that. One that we had, one is that it's very difficult to to scale to three D and to to bigger you know to to normal scale. The second problem, which is less obvious, is the lack of generalized. Data. I mean, I mean, so if you train with a certain type of data. It, it will reconstruct, but it will always want to reconstruct in the same kind of data that you trained with. Does that mean? So if you trained with heads, uh, lots and lots of heads and sinograms of heads, and to want to and you learn to reconstruct directly from sinogram to head without any any help, right? Then the, the network, if you give us if you give a sinogram of something else, the network will see a head anyway. You see my point? Quite to be expected, I'd say. Well, no, no, it's not. That's right. That's the thing, right? So sometimes it's not, it doesn't work like that. So in the example that I'm going to present, it doesn't work like that. So sometimes networks uh, generalize, sometimes they don't. So if you, if you do uh, denoising, for instance, then, then even if you train on a very, very specific images, denoising will work on much more general images. So it's not, it's not necessarily to be expected. And it's not really well understood when this happens and when when this doesn't happen. It's interesting. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, you will see in, in our case. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to show you, but we 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 trained. So we did, I'm going to explain. We trained a, a registration, so in for image registration. So you have two images, and you want to compute the transformation that give that transforms the, the first image to the second image, right? So we trained with artificial data. So we put just random ellipses and uh, you, we choose a random deformation and we show the original ellipses and the transformed ellipses and, we, and the network has to find by itself the transformation that best transforms the first image to the second image. And then we apply it to a completely different image and it still works. Okay, so that's an example of a, of a good generalization property. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't really, uh, ponder too much about the, uh, the installation. Uh, where we work, we have machines which are already installed. Uh, so so the, the biggest problem is indeed the drivers, the CUDA driver, I agree with that. And then we decided to, to install everything else as much as possible with Conda, with Anaconda. Included TensorFlow GPU and everything, and that's, that works really very well, in my opinion. And now even STIR, right? Even STIR can be installed with Conda. So everything is installed with Conda. Uh, for the registration uh, network that I was talking about, we use a library, and it's, but it's a library which is written in Python. It's, it's, it uses, b below it uses Keras and TensorFlow, but the, the whole library is in Python. So it's, it's, it was a mess because it's, they didn't really uh, put it well together, but it's just Python, really. It's not very difficult to install at all. So I would say, all in all, there's not so many difficulties if you, if you work like that. Uh, yeah, I should add also that we have written our own Python interface on top of STIR. So STIR has Python bindings, but we wrote specific uh, kind of Python interface 
so that uh, from our point of view, if, I, if we want to use a STIR operator, a STIR projector or an Astra projector, it's exactly the same code for us. Does that make sense? So that's the, the Python, with this Python, you know, the, the Python interface, I mean, the, the rest of the architecture is, is not much of a headache. So then the, the, next, uh, the next thing to do is to, to train, and you do that once and for all. I guess this is what the previous speaker showed when he just started the training. You, you, uh, you, you, you train, I mean, for, for us, the training took a, a, few, a few hours. We didn't push it so much. I guess if we pushed it to, to really a very good network, it would, it would have taken more than that, but a few hours. And so you, want, you simply uh, store the weight of the network once it's trained, okay? You, you, you store it on a file and then you can use it for, for a million experiments if you want. So this is how we did. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, uh, I should mention also that for the training, this library includes some kind of package to do, to work out, to compute the transformation on an image. So if you have a transformation which is given uh, and you have an image, it computes the transformed image, okay? What we should have done would be to, to have a nice Python interface on, I mean, a kind of a operator point of view of that, of that operation. And once we have done that, then implementing some kind of modified expectation, the EM, MLEM algorithm, it have been trivial to do. We didn't do that. We, we implemented this MLEM uh, by hand, so to speak. Uh, I don't know if what I'm saying here is very clear, but we, we simply, so in, um, so when I was, I was saying that we have a Python interface to Star and Astra, right? It means that we have an operator, a general notion of a uh, linear operator, for instance, and for which we can compute, for instance, the adjoint, right? And then we can compose any two operator and so on and so forth. So if you have all these notions, you can, you can just describe the MLEM algorithm for general operators, right? And uh, if you do that, it's very simple. We, uh, what I'm just saying here is that we should have done, but we didn't. We could have, but we didn't. Uh, we, we use this, uh, this underlying uh, transformation operator, but without this nice little uh, uh, and we implemented then everything by hand, which was stupid. Uh, okay. Uh, but Olivier can ask. So the uh, you are saying you want to have an MLEM type of operator which transforms images, but actually, in this case, it takes some signings and gets you an image out potentially with an initial image as a, as a start. So. Uh, so, an operator that does an iteration, is that what you're saying? So, uh, so uh, yeah, this is where I should have had some slides. So, what you do is the algorithm works like that. You, st you start, you have gated data, right? right. So, for, you, have, uh, you have a sinogram each for each gate, right? So, then you use MLEM uh, a few times on each, on each gate to get an image. Okay, yeah. then you run, you, you once you, so you've, load, you've saved the weights of the network, so you, you've, load, you've loaded the weights, the network which is ready to be used, and you use it to register each image. So it gives you a transformation between each reconstructed image for each gate. So between each gate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Between each cons consecutive gates, you, th you now have a, a transformation which transforms so it's noisy, but you, the, the network can still recognize the transformation that works well. Okay. And once you have these transformations, you can have a, a kind of a improved uh, EM algorithm, which now uses all the sinograms at once. I mean, not, not added together, but it's like, a, I mean, I, I don't know how to, I should have, uh, I mean, it's, it's like you, you, have, it, you have a new operator, which consists of, of the, the forward operator, composed with the transformation and you have that for each gate you have you have like like a, a row so you have a row for each gate right uh, and a block an operator row for each gate okay. 
Okay, so you have a big operator and you run LEM on that, basically. That's what it, what it boils down to. Uh, so, so that's, and, and basically that's it. So, you, so yeah, that's what we did. Okay. Um, yeah, so, 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 so it's, it was the proof of concept. So it, it, we didn't use, we didn't do any uh, attenuation correction, for instance. So it was very, uh, so we, we keep, we try to keep it simple, but the idea was to, to see if it could scale to 3D. And uh, we did some experiments with it and, and it, it, it works in 3D. So, so because registration works in 3D, uh, almost as fast as registration in 2D. There's no problem with that. So this is really, really what uh, the, the, the original motivation for that. Okay, so you, if I can ask about the attenuation case, maybe not so much the machine learning aspect here, but you say you, you didn't simulate attenuation or you didn't include it in the reconstruction? That's right. So we, in fact, so we, we, we used, uh, we used uh, synthetic data even so for everything, for the training and but also for, for testing the algorithm. And so we, we didn't include, we didn't, we didn't model the attenuation correction. Okay. All right. And so the, the machine learning aspect is on the registration side. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's, it's almost decoupled right from the reconstruction. You, you reconstruct first for each gate, then you register with machine learning, and then you reconstruct using the information the machine learning uh, gave you. Okay. So the registration takes no account all type of transformations originally. If Please, can you say that again? Takes into account all kind of transformations. It is not rigid and all, all this kind of stuff. So, oh no, it, it, it was fully non-rigid transformations. All right. And you, you so it was arbitrary. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. And you could do that no matter how nosy the data were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yes, exactly. Yes, we could. I mean, that's because I don't have a very scientific explanation, but I, I suppose that even if it's noisy, you can get the roughly the, the general motion. I mean, you get an idea of the motion, even if, even if it's noisy. And the network managed to, to do that. I actually, I don't remember. I don't even think that we. Data. This is generalization here. So we, we didn't, we trained with data without noise, as far as I remember. Uh, and even noisy data, the network managed pretty well. So if you have too noisy data, the network doesn't do a good, a good work, of course, if it's really too noisy. So you have a kind of balance to find. If it's really too noisy, there's, there's no way. But, right. uh, but, but still pretty noisy data we had. From your training data set, you changed shapes and added noise. Both things happened concurrently. So we, we could have trained with noise. I don't think we did that, but you, you could do that. I, I'm not, sh I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly, but I don't, I don't think we trained with noise. Ah, uh, hang on. I don't remember. I, I want to tell you something stupid. I think we trained without noise. So you, you, you can train, I'm pretty sure we did that. So uh, a question from Raul here. Um, the network doesn't have any notion about uh, registration really right rigid or or deformable or whatever it is it just tries to map two images together well you can i uh, know you i mean you can uh, the thing is right you you have many many ways to 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 register one image to another so you have to kind of in, in the network you have to more or less explicitly actually explain what kind of uh, uh regular you want. You can also, if you want, you can force to do a rigid, rigid transformation. You choose. But we chose to have an arbitrary transformation with a certain kind of regularization. So you don't want, basically, we, uh, what the network uh, gives us is a vector field, which, when integrated, gives us transformation. And we don't want this vector field to be too, too violent, right? So you, you want this vector field to be uh, 
smooth, I mean, not varying not too, too widely, basically. That's how we imposed the regularization. regularization. But you see from a, from a vector field, I mean, uh, integrating a vector field, you can have many, many, many transformations possible, right? Could you use any figure of merit to, 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 to see how well the, the transformation works? Yes, uh, it's uh, something we've experimented with, but not certainly not enough. But but yes, that's a so that's a, that's actually a good point in in our case because we, you can actually do exactly what you say. You can check that the the registration works well. It works, right? Yeah. You, and no matter how bad if you if you had trained the network badly or so, or something, it gives you something stupid. You would know it. So I think that's an important, when you talk about networks and medical applications, that's a very, very important point, isn't it? So you, you have a way to, to check that the network is working well for you. And then you do the, the, the reconstruction and you can be sure that it, it's doing a good job, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you were, you're asking for a figure of merit, we use PSNR for all the, all the, all the comparisons. Okay, um, so how long did it take you to get this registration network up and running and give you sensible results? Uh, so you mean the time it took us to, to do everything until we got some, some decent uh, registration, uh, like the development type time, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, order of magnitude, you know, it's a, a week, a month. Um, yeah, it, it, it may have taken a, a month. It could be, yes. Because the problem is the network that we, we used was not made exactly for that. So we had to adjust to our needs. And in particular, what is, can be a problem is that you have, the network has parameters, right? You can, it's a unit, so someone, I, I think the, the, the previous speaker told about this. This is a very standard architecture. But unit has parameters. And depending on your uh, resolution, you would need different parameters and you have to find them yourself. So you, you have more, may, maybe you have, have a little bit more layer here. Right. There are not so many parameters to, to, to tweak, but a little bit. So it took us a little while before we managed to train this network properly, actually. Yes, I would be lying if I didn't say so. So it's, it took us maybe a month to, to get it really running from nothing to to uh, complete a, a really well working uh, registration network it, it took us a month i would say yes and each time you change the res resolution you have to adjust these parameters and so on so it, it's not completely uh, it's not that easy okay because it, it's going to depend on voxel sizes and number of voxels and all of that stuff <sighs> I, I guess it I don't know exactly. I guess it's it's a problem that uh, some. I mean, maybe this problem is solved somewhere, but it's. Uh, I I couldn't see it. Uh, I mean, th these networks are a bit experimental. I don't. I don't. I don't see that. I don't think that people who work really care so much about these problems like resolution of the input images. So, yeah. but but maybe some pe some people must have thought uh, about these problems. It must have been solved, but we don't know the solution, so we we did it manually ourselves. Yeah, so there was, uh, I'm not sure what the reference was, but I remember there was a thing where uh, this research group had data from different scanners, and they were trying to do something like this registration or something like that. So they normalized all of the images to have the same kind of resolution, dimensions, etc., image space. And then just to see how different they were, they tried to train a network to distinguish just based on the images from which scanner it came from, and it could distinguish like 90% accuracy or something like that, which scanner the image originated from which is something clinicians would be able to do, but clearly there must be still some information in those images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. So uh, is, is the registration network, is that all part of ODL now, or is that still some... No, no, uh, I think it will not be. I mean, it's not, I don't, I don't think it will be part of ODL, uh, honestly. It's a completely different piece of network uh, of software, really. So, so I would I would keep it separate from from ODL. It's really independent 
vector body yeah, it's just you give it to two images and gives you a a vector field so i mean it's it's really different what should be in ODL and isn't is these these nonlinear deformations that I explained, they should be part of ODL, and we we haven't done that yet, but they should be. And once once they are, uh, these kind of modified EM algorithm will be easier to implement. But the network, I don't think it's the point. It's it's not the point of ODL to to include this. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? Come on, mind maybe as well? Mm, no? Unless somebody's trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> okay, no, well, thank you, Olivier. And uh, my apologies for uh, your surname. I don't know, I, I must have been thinking about that. No worries, no worries. <laughs> no worries at all. Famous place. <laughs> It was another French French sounding name, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, website. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good. So our our next talk is by uh, Christopher Sieben. So I guess you have. Uh, are you not sharing screen? So this should be alright. So Christopher, I, yeah, I have a presentation. So do you see my screen already? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, then I can start it. Um, and good that we have the talks before that because now I can adjust maybe a little bit to that. Um, so yeah, so I have implemented the last um, year or I started one and a half years ago uh, to implement the Python reconstruction operators in neural network, Pyron and framework as I call it. And um, Sure. Uh, firstly, I give you a short overview over these, what we are calling the known operator or, or embedding known operators into the neural networks. And this is pretty interesting. It's regarding also to questions which come up um, earlier in the talk. <laughs> then I give you a short um, overview over the Pyron and framework so um, you know what we are talking about. And then I have um, detailed implementation, yeah, uh, implementation details on how you can implement such a kernel for tensor. And okay, going to this, what we're calling known operators. So what we want to do is that we want to have um, known operators within our neural networks and still want to use uh, the power of deep learning like convolutions, fully connected layers and so on. And do I have here something like a spotlight? Ah, oh, yeah, okay. And Regarding the question, for example, um, if you uh, can reconstruct just with the unit from the sinogram domain to the reconstruction domain, yes, you can do that. But the problem is always, especially for the medical imaging cases, that you're dependent on your data and you're not sure what's about adversarial attacks, for example, or where do your output of the network will degenerate. Um, depending on an input you haven't seen, for example, we have trained uh, a unit to do a limited angle reconstruction. And if we add noise that the network hasn't seen in training, um, then the leash is disappearing in the reconstruction. And this is all stuff we don't want to do. So, and this is why we came up with, um, at our lab with the idea of this known operators. And this is an, on multiple ways beneficial. It's so, especially, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Christopher, uh, you, you might be a bit far away from your microphone, if that's possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, my, wait, I can... Uh, it's better now, now? Now it's okay, but sometimes you fade away. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, thank you. So, um, uh, so, but this is very beneficial for physics-based or signal processing tasks where we have a lot of knowledge over the domain from the past 50 or 100 years research, right? So, and we don't want to throw that away. Um, we want to use that and include that in the deep learning case. And so uh, we have shown that this, this can reduce the error bound. And I have um, a link here down there on the archive preprint. Um, if you're interested in kind of this topic, I, uh, yeah, you can read it. I think it's quite interesting. What is um, really very nice about this concept is that you reduce the amount of parameters. And reducing the amount of parameters in such a network um, always goes also to a reduction of the data you need to train the network, which is also for the medical field very favorable. As we all know, it's pretty 
how to get a lot of data labeled um, that we can run a supervised learning approach here. And the third good thing is that we gain interpretability. And um, I mean with that, uh, since you plug in known operators in here, you know from physics or from math, you constrain your network very hardly. But if we think about this operator, you could be a reconstruction operator for CT, so a back projection. Then you directly see that this convolution layer in front will do a pre-processing here and on the projection domain. So you gain a lot of information about these networks, which is very nice for medical um, image processing because now you can look at your network and don't see a highly nonlinear complex set where you don't know what happens because you constrained it very hard. So you know what actually the different parts are doing. And last but not least, you get a gradient flow through the different domains if your operators support subgradients at least. Um, and the example for this is um, if you would try to reduce or compensate for artifacts in your, in your um, projection domain, then often these artifacts are not really present in the, in the projection domain itself. So you don't see them in the projections or the sinogram. Um, but here they are much more easy to compensate for, where the artifacts are really representing in the reconstruction domain. And using such an approach now, you can compute a loss function in the reconstruction domain. So where your artifacts are occurring, and then you can propagate the arrow back down to the projection domain and compensate it here. So uh, these are all beneficial um, things of using this known operators within neural networks. And how to achieve this now from a software point of view, this is what I am showing you in the, in the talk now. <clears throat> okay, uh, okay, I can skip that thing. Um, so we have an efficient solution for the CT reconstruction, which is the filtered back projection, right? So this is um, also why we have no need to use a unit to reconstruct or, or train a fully connected layer like, like the automap paper from 2018 to reconstruct that stuff because we know mathematically what's happening there. So we can, can conduct this in three steps. We have the convolution with the RAM filter, we have a back projection, and then we can suppress negative values. And this can also be mapped to a matrix notation, right? Where we have AX mm. equal to P and to reconstruct X, we just need the inverse of A, which is not invertible. So we use the pseudo, uh, the pseudo inverse here, the Penrose Moore pseudo inverse, where A transposes the back projection and this inverse bracket, according to the filtered back projection algorithm, has to be the filter. So we can substitute this again and just have a diagonal matrix K in the Fourier domain and then a back projection step here. So this would be a filtered back projection in matrix notation. And since a neural network is just matrix multiplication with nonlinearities in between, you can directly map this to a neural network, which would be looking like this. Um, here you can see that we have a filtering layer K, so we can set this to trainable and learn a filter, for example, and we have here a back projection layer, which does the reconstruction. To be able now to learn something like the filter of K, we need to be, um, compute also the derivative of this layer with respect to the inputs, which is in this case pretty simple because it's just A, so A is the derivative of A transpose, so we know we need the forward projector to compute the arrow from the right side to the left side. So, and interesting here is that I modeled them as a fully connected layer, also the Fourier transforms here, but actually these are obviously not fully connected layers since we are not able to cover this or hold this matrix A really in our memory because it's much too big, right? So what we are doing here is from the theoretical point of view, we're looking at this as a fully connected layer with fixed weights. What we are actually doing is we calling CUDA kernels to compute the back projection or the forward projection. So we just computing on an algorithmic way the results of this A transpose or A multiplication. Um, so in this leads us to the Pyrene and framework, which is open source and it's under the Apache 2.0 license. So feel free to copy all the code which you can find there. And we provide in here a projector and back projectors for the 2D parallel and fan beam case, as well as for the 3D cone beam case. And we have a Python high level API to make it more easier for the user to use the, our layers. So we have a layer abstraction with automatic gradient registration. We have geometry classes, phantoms and data generators. So as an example, the base class would 
uh, contain volume information, detector information, and geometry. So, uh, and the specialized class would look like, uh, would add a uh, trajectory property with has unit vectors um, with the angle theta from zero to the angular range, describing our rotation around the center of the world origin. And for the 3D cone beam, the trajectory is based on perfection matrices, which allows you to use calibrated matrices from real systems, which is also pretty cool, right? And then, as I said, we have layers. So the forward projectors for all these cases is implemented as a ray-driven variant on the CUDA, and the back projection is implemented as voxel-driven. And all the gradients are internally already registered, and I show you how to do that later. So if you think now I have a CUDA kernel already implemented and I want to use that as a layer in a fully trainable end-to-end -end neural network for the next two days, for example, in your hackathon with your libraries. And the question is, how can you achieve that? You can achieve that. So first, let's look on the software architecture of TensorFlow. So you have actually the training libraries here. It's like Keras and you have Python and C++ clients. So all the languages where you can access TensorFlow from. And you have the C API from TensorFlow doing all the connections in between this high level and this low level one. And then here are the kernel implementations you want to do. And also what we did with Pyro and Anna is we add here kernel implementations on this level. And additionally, we have the Python API, which makes it more convenient for the users. <clears throat> so the custom ops in TensorFlow. Uh, the first important part is, of course, TensorFlow allows custom algorithms as layers. And I put you the link here. So if you Google for a custom ops TensorFlow, you will find this link. And so last year or one and a half years ago, this guide was very shitty. So it was very difficult to get it running and it was very complicated and not um, well documented. This is not true anymore. So I can really highly recommend to read it if you think about using a CUDA kernel in TensorFlow and you have the CUDA kernel already programmed, look into this guide. This really gives you all the information you need. So in short, the requirement is that you need, of course, a C++ or CUDA implementation of the operator you want to include into your neural network. Um, you additionally need a C++ class for the op registration. That's how TensorFlow call it. And this is um, in, real, in reality in the implementation of an interface of TensorFlow. So you follow it just according to TensorFlow. A third step is you need a gradient registration on the Python level, or if you're not providing a gradient, you need something like that. Um, I want to add here that PyTorch is also providing such stuff in two different ways. You can have a just-in-time compiler for CUDA code or also a, a compilation uh, before the, the runtime. But I haven't deal with PyTorch that much for now, so I can't give you information there, but I have a lot of information for TensorFlow. So if you have a kernel, the question is, how do you compile it? So in TensorFlow offers you two options here. You can uh, have a pure compilation using GCC and NVCC. And then you are compiling against the TensorFlow binary, which is installed in your Python interpreter. And this is very annoying and leads to version conflicts all the time, and, but it was the case. Yeah? So last year I did this, I showed, uh, uh, starting the development of Pyro and Anna, I looked into this and it, it was very tedious and I was just annoyed by that because it was um, so problematic to get the stuff running and distribute it to the cluster and to other users. But um, nowadays the guide I showed on the slides before is really improved and they give you all the flex and hinds you need to be to, to get rid of this version conflicts. And additionally, I linked this with this and the first link here, they provide a Docker container, which is set up such that you can just mm -hmm. plug in your CUDA code and your C++ custom registration class. And then it's compiled against the currently distributed TensorFlow version in the Python repositories. So actually for um, for today, I would kind of recommend probably this way with Docker container on Ubuntu if you want to distribute and if you want to code on kernels here. The only downside I can highlight here is that it's not working with TensorFlow 2.0 currently, but this is still in beta. The issue is open. I think this will be um, fixed soon, TM. 
Um, okay, though, the second way would be within the TensorFlow sources. So TensorFlow um, allow, says you can build our sources from scratch and then we have a certain folder, very deep. There can you copy all, all your stuff and we will build a shared object and this you should have to load manually. So this is also not very convenient. This is why we introduced uh, our own Pyro in um, build setup. So this is actually, we taking the TensorFlow sources, we adjusting the build process, we provide patches for that. So you, you just apply the patch and then your TensorFlow is, is ready for that. Then you have one folder, the Pyro and layers folder, and there you can plug in all your CUDA kernels and all your C++ um, op registration classes and the stuff is built. And the cool thing is now with our adjustments, you build only one TensorFlow VHA file, which contains a version of TensorFlow and your custom kernels and the stuff is working together. And this file is easily shippable to clusters and other users because you just send them the file and say pip install on that and it will work for them. So this is why we go for that. So, and this is uh, mainly due to the point that the first option of TensorFlow was pretty shitty last year. And we decided for the second one with some benefits. So uh, here again, as I said, we have Pyro and N, which is compiled side by side with the sources. All shared objects are in one intermediate folder and all packaged together into one Python file. <clears throat> so, how can you do now this op registration where I talked about? Um, it's basically composed of three parts. You need a layer description, you need uh, interface implementation of the constructor, and you need the actual layer function. So let's start here. So uh, to register a layer, you need to call the register op macro from TensorFlow and you add here a name for your layer. Then you define input and output. So you can have multiple inputs and you can have multiple outputs. You just have to add them here. So if you have information for your layer, which is not really an, in an input or an output, you can set attributes as I did here for the trajectory, for example. So, and what is also interesting here, interesting is this set chain. So this set shape function is a lambda function, is a lambda construct and will be called by the TensorFlow graph constructor to check your shapes. If you do not implement that, the graph constructor will not checking your shapes in the whole graph and give you arrows or hints where you have problems, you have to debug that for your own. Also, if you want to go to Keras layers with your own layers, they want to have um, the shape information from you. So you have to do it in a tedious way on Python or you implement. So my recommendation is if you implement a layer, um, com yeah, implement the set shape function. It's optional, but do it and make it makes it much easier for you. Okay, the second step is we need a class, right? So we need a class parallel projection to the op and we uh, derive it from the public OP kernel class. The OP kernel class, this is the interface or this is the TensorFlow API we have to follow. And this is the main class for all the layers in TensorFlow or interface, better saying. So <clears throat> you can set up now a lot of member variables here and then you can extend the actual constructor. And what you're doing in the constructor is actually reinterpret the memory from Python on the C++ level. So you can ask the current context for get an attribute and you see this is our exactly the attributes we defined on the previous slide, on the previous slide, right? Here, so uh, volume shape, for example, is from type shape. So we want to have this volume shape, we give in a pointer and we feed to the member variable directly the shape. And then we can read it out and get the volume height and the volume width for it. If you have the type tensor for your attribute, you need a tensor here. You can feed in the tensor with the same type, get attribute. Then you get out the TensorFlow tensor, which contains an eigen tensor. And there you can say uh, the eigen tensor should be from type float with one dimension for each entry. And then you can read it out again to get the volume origin, for example. So now your layer need a function. For that, you have to override the compute function. The compute function is called from TensorFlow every time your the TensorFlow wants to evaluate your layer. So and you, oh sorry, wrong, wrong direction. And for this. First, of course, we need our inputs for the layer. So you can ask the context again for the input. So, and if you have multiple inputs, then you have, of course, indexing these inputs here. Then we need to store our output somewhere. So we need to allocate output with a certain shape 
and then we have an output tensor where we can store our result of layer. And then actually last but not least, you can call this parallel projection to the kernel launcher. And from this point on, you're free from any TensorFlow magic. It's just pure C++ cuter. So what is still interesting here on this slide? Interesting is this part. Because you have to think about the batch size. Um, in my first implementation, I just ignored the batch size and it runs. So it's working. But I, at this point again, my recommendation is Think about if you implement that, do you want to support a batch size greater than one when yes, then you should have a for loop here, for example, right? Going through all your batch samples and calling your CUDA kernel for each batch um, data set you have. And the second point is most TensorFlow layers requires a batch size. This means the convolution says, the conf2d layer in TensorFlow says that the first dimension of my tensor has to be the batch dimension where the batch size is stored. And if you do not support this with the, your layer, then you have the problem that you get um, shape problems within the graph and this have to be fixed on the Python level. Or you even don't get any errors and the graph runs, but do crazy stuff. So this is very really tedious. My recommendation is think about the batch size and then define the output shape accordingly and make the batch dimension mandatory, even if you do not support a batch size greater than one. I can really highly, highly recommend it to do that because you get rid of a lot of problems. So uh, short thing, look at the kernel launcher. Every one of you who have already implemented CUDA will see that this is just CUDA code. And then we make a block size in the grid size here and call our actual, actual CUDA. And of course, think about the cleanup. You have to free your memory yourself. Um, what is interesting here, this QR malloc stuff is all problematic because TensorFlow manages the memory itself. So a better visualization for that is if you start initially with TensorFlow, it will take uh, per default 95% of your GPU memory. For an 8 gigabyte graphics card that you're left with 400 megabyte left here. And every CUDA malloc you call here, so every CUDA malloc and CUDA copy you use here will be allocated in this free space and not in this context because TensorFlow managing this itself. So it's blocking all this memory. So you can avoid this by using TensorFlow allocators because they're providing three allocators here. And I have linked that Stack Overflow question with pretty um, nicely describes how do you manage this memory stuff using TensorFlow. So I also recommend don't use CUDA mallocs, just use the TensorFlow allocators because you get rid of this memory sharing problem. There is only one situation where you can't rely on that. And that's, this is if you want to use texture interpolation. So if you want to use the texture um, from the CUDA where you have a hard, hardware interpolation, which is much faster, um, then you cannot do that. And the reason for that is the 3D um, texture wants to have a CUDA array and the CUDA array is only, alloc uh, you can only allocate a CUDA <coughs> array if you have a so-called pitched pointer. And such a this means uh, such a pitch point, they have a certain, uh, this, um, uh, they store the, the, the information differently in the memory to have a uh, fast read access on that. So this means if you want to use this texture interpolation, you need a pitch pointer while all the TensorFlow allocators and also the TensorFlow tensor is not a pitch pointer. So you have to copy it. So this doubles your memory requirements for your layer. And the problematic thing is, as I said, every the allocation you do will be in the free memory here. So if you think about allocating in 3D volume um, for a CT reconstruction in this small 400 megabyte thing, you get easily out of memory error, even if you know you have enough memory. So you have to ensure that enough memory is outside available of this TensorFlow context. I can show you that on the later slides, as slides how this works. So we have implemented now our parallel projector as a CUDA kernel and used and want to use them in, Py in Python or in TensorFlow. And we can do that in a way. So we go to our Pyron and layers namespace now, taking our parallel projection, feed in an input volume. And here we have a lot of attributes. And you see, these are exactly the attributes we described in the layer description in C++. And then we feed in all our, our information. One hint here again, if you use um, the attribute, the type 
tensor for an attribute, you can't feed in directly NumPy arrays. You need to make a tensor proto out of it with this construct here. And now, of course, we need a gradient. So we need, we use this decorator, which TensorFlow provides this add ops register gradient. Here you plug in the C++ name of the class where you want to compute the gradient for. Then you define a function which computes the gradient. And in our case, the gradient is pretty simple. We just make Pyron layers parallel back projection 2D the gradient as an input, and then I have a lot of attributes here. And then we're returning the gradient um, after the layer. So, and then we have something to train. So uh, an example now for using 2D parallel with our Pyron and framework is you define volume parameters, detector parameters, trajectories, etc. Then you construct the geometric parallel 2D object, feed in all your information, get your object, then you use one of our circular trajectory generators to get a set of ray vectors, and then you set this ray vector. Then we need um, some phantom, like a Chef Logan phantom here. This is just a NumPy array. We add the dimension for the batch. And then we can go in here and use our parallel projection 2D feed in the phantom and the geometry in getting out the result. As this is a graph description in TensorFlow, we have to evaluate that, and you see here's the sinogram. <clears throat> then we can filter it, and we have a filtered sinogram. What is interesting also on the slide is this three lines of code. So this is how you manage um, the memory consumption of TensorFlow. You can tell TensorFlow to please just use a fraction of the GPU memory. So with these three lines, the 8 gigabytes graphics card uh, would give TensorFlow 4 gigabytes, so 50%. And if TensorFlow would need more, it allows a growth. So if you use these three lines, you can handle your memory problems with this TensorFlow context and the computer mallocs where they are belonging to. So, and then you have the parallel projection where you can feed in the sinogram filter and the geometry, and then you get out a reconstructed chip logan phantom. So <clears throat> just a few links here. I can send you the, lights, the, the slides afterwards. So all, a lot of code examples are presented on the Pyron and repository. The actual layer implementation can be found in another uh, repository, which is the Pyron and layers. And this contains a whole guide. I show you that um, in a few minutes, a whole guide how you install such a C++ kernel with the TensorFlow sources. So um, this allows you to have a folder where you throw in for example, your current framework, build it with TensorFlow, and then it should be available. A lot of more material you can find under the free deep learning resources from our lab. There I have also an example where we learn the reconstruction filter. And then we have here a code ocean capsule where this filter training is available as runnable code. So, and now I have to look how I can change the window I've sh I'm sharing. Uh, how does it work? I think you probably have to stop sharing and then uh, share again and uh, choose. Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, a short view on the, the repository side. Um, yeah, so these are the C++ calls. You see there is just all the projectors in. <clears throat> we have here patches. So which this you adjust the TensorFlow build process as I explained on the slides. And then you have pretty um, here easy commands. So with this, you compile the, the CUDA kernel, uh, all the kernels, TensorFlow and your own. And this is building your Python package and then you can just install it with this. Um, okay, so what I actually want to show because we had is on the previous talk um, is one more example shortly. Let's go here. So uh, we want to learn where we start here. Uh, ah, yeah, we want to learn. If we want to learn a reconstruction filter, so with this network, would we would like to learn this filter here? Um, we come up with this idea because if you make a plain implementation of the of the theory from the book, and you use the RAMP and not the ramp like filter, then you get the severe artifacts like cupping and DC shift. And our idea was now to 
just as a proof of concept, can we learn from the RAM lag, so, uh, from the RAMP, so the mathematically correct solution, um, the correct discretized way? And for this, we're setting up this pipeline. So uh, we have, so this is all now um, regarded TensorFlow. We have a lot of handling these sessions and your training data and stuff. But um, what I want to show here is um, our training data. So we use as training data, just numerical data, like a very small circle and a very big one. And we have much more. So we have as validation that bears. We have as a test, the Shablogan, and the copying test is just a big circle. So, and we just use this numerical data to train the network, so to learn a filter. And this is generalizing just to real data, so no problem at all. So this is also why this known operator concept is really nice for medical or for signal processing, because you can analytically derive what you want to do, where are your heuristics part away, you, you don't have an analytical solution, then learn that. Probably uh, this is working because you have very few parameters just on the uh, just on the numerical phantoms, and this will generalize definitely to real data. <clears throat> so, yeah, though this would be now uh, just to show you the model. The model here would be uh, TensorFlow FFTs, as the FFT you want to have a complex port six four. You have to cast it here. Then we do a multiplication. This is also what we had in the first talk, right? If you you if you do it in the in the Fourier domain, you have a you have maybe a one pixel sized filtering kernel, and this spans over the whole spatial domain as we are in the Fourier. So you don't need a very big convolutional la layer here for this. And then we can use again the back projection layer um, to get the reconstruction. And yeah, so what I want to show you here more is, let's see. So this example is runnable in this code ocean and the, the slides are available. So that's why I'm skipping this a bit. Uh, ah, yeah, so here I want to show you the results. So this are maybe interesting, right? So this is the initial RAMP reconstruction we had. Then this is the, the RAM lag solution where we want to come and our learned reconstruction look pretty nice the same. So and if we look into the filters, we can see that the network just learned on numerical data how the direct discretization would look like. And this, this filter is now you can just read out the weights of this layer and use it then without any deep learning context just in your algorithms. So this is pretty nice if you think about limited angle or uh, very hard uh, short scan cases where you don't have redundancy weights available on an analytical way, instead of using an heuristical measurement, you could use a um, data driven, data optimal way. Also, with the filter, where we want to go with this is if you think about you, you add now a certain noise model into your training data, you should get a filter which is optimal reducing this noise model. So instead of a heuristic Shablogan filter or cosine weighted filter, you can derive an optimal filter based on your noise model. Yeah, and this now concludes my talk. <laughs> well, great, thank you. Um, okay, questions please. Let me just... how, how would that uh, cope with uh, different noise levels? H how would you imagine that working? You say it kind of custo is customized to the noise in your data, but what about when there are when there's a wide range of noise levels? Um, would you imagine it being a whole bank of filters that get used, or how do you envision that? Um, I think that depends on how you set this up. In general, you can think um, about, especially with this filter learning, right? Um, at the end, we're using an optimizer in TensorFlow to minimize the square optimization problem with respect to the weights of the filter, right? And um, so we haven't looked at this in detail, but we assume that if we include noise a data, uh, yeah, noise in the data, a certain noise model, we get something like a Wiener filter out of that. But um, this is an hypothesis, we have to check this um, still. Um, but I think you can, uh, I mean, it's not, so what I show you is not really the, the high level denoising deep learning capability. It's more like um, sticking back to a very analytical pipeline way, but this is pretty beneficial because still we are able to use the context of the deep learning or the powerness of deep learning, but 
be a bit more interpretable, which I think is kind of important for medical images we want to do a diagnosis on. Yeah, I mean, you know, so a vena filter would still have a, a magical hyperparameter, and I guess that's the catch is that, uh, I mean, I really like what you're presenting here. I think it's, it's very neat indeed. Obviously, it would just be uh, even better if it somehow could be uh, noise adaptive and give you the kind of the correct hyperparameterization of your learned filter according to the noise level in the data. That would be yeah, you, really neat. Yeah, right. You would get the hyper the the ideal hyperparameter probably in uh, since this is a heuristical measurement, right? You can <coughs> say what is the what is the best one, but we can say if you use this concept what I presented now, you can at least get um, a data optimal hyperparameter. And then you, of course, depend on the data set, right? But this is what deep learning is all about, depending on the data set. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, the um, So on this free um, learn, uh, on this free deep learning resource um, site, there are a lot of slides, but not what I presented you um, now in the main part. But I, I send you that after the session, okay? Is that fine? Yeah, that would be great. And um, if you don't mind, if you would be able to put that on our website as, as well as, as a PDF or something. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I can, I can make that to a PDF. And that. So, uh, Edo here. Um, I'm just uh, uh, curious if I understand correctly. So you implemented uh, the, the RAMP filter or something similar from filter back projection as a layer in TensorFlow and then TensorFlow, you use TensorFlow basically to learn the RAM filter. Yes. Okay. So that was a proof of concept or more ac an academic example, right? We thought, okay, so this all following the, this known operator concept. The idea was to say, what if, if we know what's the perfect analytical solution is, the RAM filter, but what if we have no clue about the correct discretization of this filter? And since the neural network is discrete by per default, we thought though the neural network should check out the, fil the correct discretization with that um, accordingly. So it should check it out. So, and this was our concept. I have also um, one more nice concept is what we looked at into a certain rebinning process where we said we want to avoid array by ray rebinning. Um, so we sit down and write um, just in linear discrete algorithm with matrices, another approach going over the reconstruction domain. And then after we did this, we just took this math formula and mapped this to a neural network. And then we learn a filter which does a rebinning in 2D from, fan beam, uh, from parallel to fan beam. So um, this whole concept is uh, the idea of we want to use the knowledge about the domain, what we have in, but still want to use deep learning because a lot of the, the current deep learning approaches are always going into the way of, yeah, I have no highly nonlinear setup. I can do whatever I want with my data and I don't need any clue about my domain. Yes, you can do that, but this leads to a lot of problems. Um, as I said, for example, if you would, um, try to learn the reconstruction operator as a fully connected layer. You won't get this running on uh, on data sizes, which is yeah, capable of using real data, right? Because it's much too big. If you use the Pyron N framework um, I presented you, you have the whole control over the memory and all of your the devices resources. So you're much better able to to get it running on a size which matters and not on toy cases like 64 times 64. Uh, because you, you, of course, you're not doing one step in neural network. You are using the real steps, right? So you, yeah. you yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because it's from the theoretical point of view, it's a fully connected layer with fixed weights. But actually, we just compute an algorithm which is efficient. And since we're coding this on the QL level by our own, we have the full control over the resources. Okay. And so the Thank you. I, I understand it correctly that you're initializing your uh, deep learning filter with a RAM filter. First. Yes. Yeah. This is also one thing, right? Um, I, uh, as, as we wrote the paper, I also got asked by a reviewer why we don't try random initialization. And the simple answer is why should we? We have this knowledge about the domain. So 
please don't throw it away. Use the knowledge of the domain, like in your case over the MR pet domain. Why not using that? We know that stuff. And we have a lot of research done the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years about that. So we are not interested in pure end-to-end -end networks and seeking every information in the data if we have the data by our own, uh, information by our own. Makes sense, yeah. It's, it, I agree totally. Did you try anyway? Um, yeah, I tried it, I think. I mean, it's kind of a long time ago and my framework wasn't that polished um, um, as it's now. I think, so the problem, so this is one that's maybe a nice aspect, though. The problem with, especially if you learn the filter in the free domain, this is from some point of view it's beneficial on the other point it's it's difficult because the update step are steps are not necessarily enforcing a very continuous shape of the filter in the free domain so you have to constrain that or as i often do is with a kind of every 10 step i do a small gaussian filtering so just i smooth out the filter rates again to get a smooth filter and i mean that it's it gets pretty long if you uh, make a random initialization. <laughs> so because you step with very small step sizes like to, um, to the power of minus seven or to the power of minus eight as a learning rate. And then you can imagine if you initialize that uh, between zero and one randomly, and you know that the beginning or at the zero frequency, you need to go down to zero and you initialize it with once, you need a lot of steps to come with 10 to the power of minus eight from one to zero. But it's of course uh, it it's working, but takes uh, much more time. Yeah, uh, th there's a question from uh, Abi Maranian uh, in mm -hmm. the chat. If you can see it, or in the chat, wait, I can look. No, uh, no, I can't see it. I, he's, he's asking your feed forward network. You mentioned eight transpose large and three less fixed. So you move back and forth between TensorFlow and CUDA reconstructor during training. So uh, A is like a black box to back propagation. Um, can you can you repeat it? It was a bit um, uh, silence. Uh, Abby, maybe you can oh, share screen. Uh, right, I could share screen. <laughs> I, I I think what. Abby's meaning is, I, I don't know if it's related to the question, are, are you properly uh, back propagating um, your gradients through the network and through, say, the A transpose that's in your network? Yeah, so um, this was the, maybe I can, uh, I don't know, can I? Oh, no, the screen is already shared by you. Um, so, um, as I said, if you, you can implement it and make it available as a layer, and then you need, of course, a gradient. And you can tell TensorFlow with this um, decorator to use another algorithm to compute the gradient. In our case, for the agent's post part, um, we need A as a gradient computation. So we um, register the forward projector um, to the back projection algorithm. So in both cases, the forward pass, um, the TensorFlow will invoke the actual CUDA back projection implementation. And during the computation of the gradient, it will invoke the forward projection in a rate-driven <coughs> manner, producing a sinogram of the errors. And if you have this not available, but I haven't tried um, this yet, you should be also able to, do, to get the gradient numerically with <coughs> Autograd. Okay, so basically you are doing things as they should be correctly done. It's not like you're kind of, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So let's check that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so what, um, if I can highlight this now, it's um, what we really want to do is um, having end-to-end -end networks from your um, sensor domain up to the domain you want to end up without any discontinuity. Because then you can propagate really the errors through all the different domain which occurring in your pipeline from the beginning of your raw data until the end. And this allows you to optimize certain steps in the pipeline which are maybe defined heuristically you can exchange them now with layers and um, be data optimal in this case and current 
a lot of current deep learning approaches like artifact reduction and CT are doing only in one domain. So either they have a supervision training on the projection domain, ending up with um, nice sinograms, feed them into reconstructions and look into the reconstruction, or they just reconstruct their sinogram and then do a post-processing. But most of them don't have the full pipeline available to be able to compute errors all between all the steps and then be adjusting um, their compensation methods or other algorithms. So this is what we re really want to achieve is this whole end-to-end -end pipeline. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are you know, methods by Honky Lim, Jeff Fessler's group, BCDNet and so on, which do do a similar kind of thing. Just to yeah, right. And so, and, so, uh, yeah. so for example, there is this um, ODL library if, from the KTH in Sweden, I think, um, or as also in the first talk were um, mentioned, uh, the Astra toolbox. So the ODL uh, framework uses the Astra toolbox to do the reconstructions or the forward projections. But the problem in this case is um, that you don't have the full control over the hardware, like as I said, with this interpolation. If you want to use the hardware interpolation, you need this pitch pointer and you uh, I just get be then very difficult if you use ODL or stuff like that. So this is why we set up the whole framework for TensorFlow with a convenient way to building it. And now, though, if you would go to the Pyron and layer framework, really, you can check this out and throw in your CUDA kernel. You only have to write this, this OP class according to the TensorFlow API, and then your CUDA kernel is available in TensorFlow. That's it, though, that's pretty straightforward now. Okay. Great. I think I think we have to move on, but uh, it's quite interesting. So thanks for for that presentation. And um, as it's all available, people can ask uh, questions later on as well. I'm sure. Uh, so thanks again, Christopher. Um, so we have Quangong uh, now online, uh, uh, wide awake in California. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we can see your screen. We can't hear you yet. You might have to unmute. Oh, hello, Hi. hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I do not know this. Uh, uh, so can I uh, go through my talk now? Yes, yes. OK, so uh, uh, thanks for um, uh, letting me uh, present my work. So um, uh, as mentioned, so I will uh, here uh, introduce um, uh, two of my current works and also um, mainly focusing on the software aspect regarding uh, how this is implemented and uh, what is the challenging part. So, um, and to give you an um, um, overview, I will go through from the introduction, uh, the method and also the results part. So, um, uh, okay. So and uh, the first one uh, I will talk about is how, how we, what we have our group have done is to uh, embed the uh, uh, the new network tra training inside the uh, path iterative reconstruction. So the main idea of this work is to combine the new network training with the traditional uh, iterative uh, path image reconstruction. So uh, uh, there are many. Uh, uh, works showing that the convolution neural network uh, can be effective uh, in uh, image processing, such as uh, 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 image denoising. And the one problem uh, is that the current method need a lot of uh, training data. And uh, when we wanted to apply this method to the image reconstruction, we need the raw data such as the sinograms. And uh, this is not uh, very uh, convenient. And also currently in the multi-modality imaging such as PADMR and the PADCT, the prior information uh, from the same patient is available. So we want to make use of this information. And in this work, we propose to train a new network without uh, training peers, but only in the prior image from the same patient. And uh, we will uh, propose to uh, embed the network training into the uh, reconstruction process. 
And we know that uh, for the uh, image reconstruction inverse problems, uh, the system uh, equation is y equals two px plus r. And uh, in our proposed method, we do a, a, a image re representation by uh, changing the unknown image x to the output of the uh, neural network here is f uh, this theta. So this approach is similar to the previous uh, kernel method to replace the x by uh, by x equals to, to uh, k alpha. So uh, and the one uh, novelty here is that uh, because this uh, network representation is nonlinear and it should have a, a stronger uh, representation power compared to the kernel method. And here, the Z, uh, as shown, uh, is the uh, input to the neural network. And here, we use the patient's prior information, such as the simultaneous acquired MR. And uh, here, the theta are the filter uh, weights and uh, the bias or other parameters of the neural network. So we wanted to train uh, this uh, network parameters during the image reconstruction process. And the we can construct the likelihood function uh, based on this new representation. So uh, instead of optimization X, here the whole process is trying to optimize the network parameters. So the network will be trained from scratch uh, during this uh, image reconstruction process. And uh, to solve this problem, um, at the current stage, we do not uh, uh, solve it directly inside the TensorFlow. Uh, because the the system matrix P is coupled with the network output. So if we want to train, train uh, from end to end, uh, you will first uh, uh, implement the system matrix inside the TensorFlow uh, framework. And uh, we, we, we think it's not very convenient. So here, what we did is to use the ADMM algorithm to decouple it into uh, three uh, sub problems. So as you, you can see the first sub problem is that we fix the network parameters. So this is an um, uh, L2 norm penalty uh, added to the original pad image reconstruction problem. And you can use the, the existing uh, pad reconstruction algorithm such as the map EM, uh, one step later, an algorithm uh, or PCG algorithm. And the second uh, problem is we fix the, the X value. And you can see that this is an L2 norm uh, loss function for network training. So the second problem is a network training approach. And the second step is the dual variable update. So our proposed framework is like to do one step um, path image reconstruction, then do one step uh, network training, and then uh, repeat this process. And to validate our uh, proposed the method, we have uh, first did a simulation study using the BrainWare Phantom. So this is the original uh, MR image. And we also have uh, the previous the kernel uh, method uh, and also a diction learning and also the EM plus filter method compared to the proposed method. So here the MR image we have inserted, uh, uh, for, for the pad image, we have inserted a pseudo uh, lesion here, but this pseudo lesion is not uh, seenable in the MR image. We want to test uh, if there are mismatches between the MR and the pad image, how the proposed method works. So you can see that uh, the tumor region uh, will show up and the recovers better than the kernel method. And also the gray matter region, you can see that it can also uh, clear than the kernel method. And we did a contrast recovery uh, re regarding the gray matter region and also the tumor region. And you can see that the proposed method can have a higher contrast recovery than the other reference method. And uh, we have a, a, a primary, this method to the real uh, simultaneously uh, Padma data set. And uh, you, you, you can see that the proposed method can have a, a higher uh, cortex uh, recovery and also the tumor region can also be re revealed uh, better. And this is the contrast recovery versus the standard deviation for the uh, tumor region. So you can see that based the curve, the proposed method can have the best uh, performance. So let's focus on uh, this um, uh, software uh, part of this approach. 
So as I previously mentioned, we use the ADMM algorithm to solve this problem. So the first step is um, a map is an a penalized path image reconstruction. And uh, in our current uh, uh, implementation, we solved it using the map EM algorithm because it's easy uh, to implement. And in, in, in this approach, we, we implemented in uh, MATLAB and uh, the system metrics P is implemented uh, uh, using C++. And uh, we use the system metrics approach, store it in the hard disk. And uh, this projector is wrapped up using the max function of the MATLAB. MATLAB. And uh, the whole map EM is written in MATLAB. And uh, for the network training, we, uh, here we use the LBFGX alg algorithm to solve. The reason we use LBFGS algorithm because here our proposed method is on supervised way, means that we do not we only have one uh, patient data set, so we do not have multiple data sets. So we can use the LBFGS algorithm. The previously when uh, people use the Adam or the SGD method, it is because they have a, a large number of training peers, and uh, the LBFGS algorithm. Uh, do not work very well, work well in a stochastic way. But here, because we only have one patient data set, we can use LBF just because, and uh, based on our previous uh, testing, it has a faster convergence rate, and also it's monotonic. So we implemented this into the TensorFlow environment, and uh, the LBF just is based on SPIPI uh, library, and uh, TensorFlow provides the interface to use this library. And the one issue uh, at current work is that uh, because the first uh, reconstruction process is implemented in uh, the uh, MATLAB and the second one is implemented in TensorFlow, so we always need to save the intermediate results to the hard disk and read it into different uh, environment. And, uh, and this saving and the reading process as well as the initialization of the TensorFlow environment can take some time. And uh, if everything can be implemented into uh, Python, the whole reconstruction will be faster. And uh, that might be our improvement for this uh, framework. And, uh, and the other work uh, I, I want to mention, uh, which has more, which is more challenging uh, from the software aspect is the on-road neural network. So for this uh, previous approach, uh, uh, it it does it, it is not very challenging. The only issue is the uh, is the computational time, but it's solvable. But uh, for this um, unload neural network, it has more uh, requirement for your implementation as well as how you uh, design uh, every step. So I will pay more attention uh, to uh, to this work and uh, discuss about the details of this work. So the on-road neural network approach is that it treat the, the iterative reconstruction, uh, the whole steps of the neural network, and it has been applied to many uh, medical image reconstruction problems. And the first is applied to the, the, the ISTA uh, uh, framework. And here we want to uh, apply it to the PET uh, image reconstruction. And there are uh, several challenges. The first one is very uh, is that it's difficult to uh, calculate the path fidelity time and particularly at the MR because MR is based on the FFT, but we have a very large system metrics. And the second challenge is that the path is uh, fully 3D and uh, it has more GPU memory and, and uh, it also has the speed concerns which need to uh, solve uh, properly. So, uh, in this work, we uh, embed the commonly used map EM algorithm as the network uh, fidelity module, and uh, we use a uh, uh, 3D CNN uh, like the 3D unit uh, uh, to uh, combine with the map EM algorithm. And also, we uh, in this work, the projector is based on the 3D distant uh, driven projector. So. Uh, when we, uh, for the penalized PET uh, image reconstruction, we suppose the penalty item is beta uh, mu x. Uh, mu x is the, uh, ux uh, is the penalty item. So if we use the gradient descent method, we can have um, 
an update equation as follows. <coughs> So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so we suppose the gradient of this uh, uh, penalty item can be replaced by uh, neural network, and uh, our previous uh, SPIE has done some uh, uh, unrolled network based on the gradient descent. Uh, so this is uh, the this is our previous SPIE work, but but we think that uh, we we. One one problem with this EMNet problem is that uh, the gradient function can contain the high frequency components, and uh, the CN should be easier to represent the smooth operation instead of a gradient function. So here is the the method of the map EM algorithm. Here we we write it to to a constraint format as follows. So we we have this con constraint format. And then based on DMM algorithm, we can get the three uh, update uh, problems. So the sub, sub problem one is a proximal uh, operation and the sub problem one, uh, sub problem two is a penalized image reconstruction. So in this uh, framework, we replace the sub problem one <coughs> by a, a CM method and we embed the we, we embed this, the second uh, penalized recom into the network training. So uh, after unroll uh, this process, we can have a whole network structure as follows. So in our current implementation, we have eight unrolls. And for each module, we do a map EM algorithm for two times. So for each module, it can have map EM, map EM, then put into the 3D unit and then get output. And the map EM uh, is shown, the update equation is shown here. And this is the unit process. And uh, in the comp later on, I will uh, show some results. And in the result, the unit with the same number of trainable parameters will be used as the reference method. So here are some uh, results and we can see that uh, the proposed on-road network can have a, a better recovery compared to the denoise approach. And also this is for the clinical data evaluation. And you can also see that uh, the on-road network can have better recovery uh, compared to the uh, denoise approach. So uh, let's uh, move on to the more uh, interesting the software uh, aspects. Uh, so, I, I, in my opinion, the most uh, challenging part comes from uh, how you embed the uh, path reconstruction into the new network. So, it comes from the uh, sub-program to uh, penalize the recon. So, how you put this uh, uh, reconstruction into the new network? The first one is that it, it has the memory concern. So, because the, the path sonograms uh, is very large, and uh, you need to uh, avoid the sonograms in the network graph. Otherwise, when you have the sonograms in the network graph and you do backward and forward projection, it will take a lot of memory of the GPU. So that's the reason why we use the map EM algorithm here, because the, as, as, as you can see that the map EM update uh, equation does not contain the sonogram compared to the primary algorithm. And the only module contains P uh, is this uh, X tempo update and it can be written in a module so that the P will not show up in the network graph. And the, the back propagation of this tempo uh, is very easy. It includes uh, two forward and one backward projection. And uh, yeah, and the beauty part of this map EM is that it only contains the images uh, in the network graph. So you do not need to worry about the memory issue. And uh, the second problem is the speed concern. So uh, at first we have tried the system metrics based projector, uh, but uh, it, it is very slow. The reason is because uh, when you do the network training, you need to read the 
system metrics into the memory uh, frequently. And this reading process is a bottleneck and it will take uh, over one second for one uh, backward and forward projection. And our second uh, try, trial is like using a multi-ray tracing based on the fry. So, but uh, this approach also has one problem because it has, it has the trade-off uh, between the speed and the aliasing artifacts. So, and finally, we, uh, we choose the distant driven projectors. We write it into a uh, CUDA and uh, uh, into the TensorFlow customer layer. And uh, here shows one example. Uh, the left one is the distant driven projector. The right one is the multi ray tracing because we currently we only draw uh, two by two lines per uh, line of response. So it's not very accurate. So you can see some uh, high frequency aliasing artifacts compared to the distant driven projector. And for this distant dual projector and the multi-ray tracing, they have a similar speed. And uh, currently, uh, I use the uh, V100 GPU. So for the distant dual projector forward, it takes about 0 0.6 second, and the backward projection takes about 1.1 uh, second. So, and uh, my summary of this unrolled uh, network training approach is that uh, for for Pat Recon, if you want to implement uh, the unroll neural network for a fully 3D image reconstruction, it is more challenging. So first you need to have a very accurate and fast projector. And uh, based on my uh, experience, if you want to make the training uh, finished in like four or five days, the forward backward projection should be less than one second. And it also, should model the pad physics well. The single ray tracing is fast, but uh, is accuracy is not enough, uh, in my opinion. And the second one is to try to avoid the sonograms in the network graph, uh, because the fully 3D image already takes a lot of memory. If you want to have very uh, fancy uh, network structure in, in implemented, you should uh, avoid the sonograms uh, in the network graph. But uh, maybe there are, uh, are, are other ways to go around this approach. And I think more effort needed to uh, develop this unrolled approach for pet image reconstruction. Uh, thank you very much for listening. That's, that's great, Kwame, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so we have uh, I would have a question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, that is problematic with um, using sinograms within your graph, right? Because of the memory consumption there. Uh, yes, that's my experience. And I'm wondering if you know the NIPS paper about so-called um, reversible residual blocks. Uh, reversible reservable. Uh, right, what reversible? So actually, what I what I want to um, maybe give you, uh, I, I haven't looked into this in detail. I'm doing it with a student right now because it, I'm running the same problems like you. The sinogram is pretty big, and you get memory issues there, right? Um, but which is um, basically due to the fact for your backpropagation algorithm, right? Because you have to store all the intermediate activations functions from your forward path, and you can avoid that using something like checkpointing, for example, just store every fifth activation and then re-compute the intermediates in between if you need them for the update step. Or they go a step further um, and said that they have, uh, they can reduce the, mem the, the amount of memories your CNN uses during the training process by um, or down to one fifth of the actual um, uh, memory consumption. So I can link you this here in the Zoom group chat. Maybe you can look at okay. this paper and uh, can fix your problems with that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I will check this approach. Yeah, if, if like, a, as, as you said, the sonograms can be uh, used in the network graph, then you can try many other uh, reconstruction algorithm which should be faster than the MAP-EM algorithm and, uh, and the, the network training should be uh, should be better because because due to the, the the memory limit, you cannot unroll many times. 
So you can only unroll like six or eight times, but uh, this have a, a speed requirement for your recon uh, or, or algorithm, yeah. Yeah, so I, um, I th and they have also an implementation in the control package in TensorFlow. So this looks highly promising. Okay, mm, that's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a possibly more scientific question on the on the first half of your presentation on the when you were using the deep image prior type of thing. So you're the here the CNN is essentially it's a generator. Yes, it, it uh, gives me my uh, prior patients, prior information, generate the current setting, which that's what you're trying to do. So you're, you're saying that you're training this network based on the data um, that you have now for your patient. Is there any um, benefit of reusing previously trained networks already to speed things up, or does that actually create problems for the network? Uh, uh, Chris, so you you are talking about uh, the uh, using the previous patient's information, right? Right. Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, uh, if I understand uh, you correctly, you mean that uh, currently in this work, the the previous patient's information is not used, right? Right. Yes. Uh, so. Um, uh, that's a very good question, and uh, and currently we are trying to embed the previous patient's information uh, into uh, this framework. And the way uh, we did it is use the previous patient's information to pre-train the network, and then let the network fine-tuned uh, during uh, this reconstruction process, because the, in in this current framework, the network is trained from scratch. Right. And uh, we think that if we use the previous patient's information uh, to pre-train the network and then uh, fix some layers during a reconstruction process, the result should be more robust. Right. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Abby is asking a few uh, chat questions. If you have to click on the orange thing to see them. Oh yeah, I'm I'm reading it. Uh, you try to me on your data. How do you deal with? It? Uh, so uh, uh, yes, and uh, I I I think Abby is mentioned about the pre-training, and uh, we are training uh the network on real data, uh, uh, be because in in this framework we do not require the high quality, uh. PET images, so the previous uh, patient data can be directly trained and then put into uh, this framework. And we do not need the simulation data to pre-train the network. Right. Okay, thank you. But, sorry, but uh, hi, hi, Kwong, it's Andrew here. Yeah. Uh, doesn't the same question apply for the second part of your talk? I mean, if we take Abby's question there, I mean, you did show that on real data as well. The clinic, yeah, slide 14 shows a demonstration on real data. And in fact, yeah, I mean, if we remove the labels, I'd probably be hard pressed to really pick a winner there. Um, so can you re-answer Abby's question for the second half? Obviously on the first half, it's not applicable because you're not actually using training data, you're just using the, the MR image uh, as input to, to a network that you're training. But what about for the EM net? Uh, uh, hi, Andrew, yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I previous answered the Abby question uh, because I thought Abby is asking the first half. Okay. And for, yeah. For the second half, yes, you need the high quality training uh, labels and, uh, and uh, the more, the better, yes. And, right. uh, uh -huh. 
Sorry, so and, the uh, question is how do you deal with variability of activity level among different patients and do you do any kind of pre-normalizations? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, for, for my current work, I, I use that because uh, in, in, in this map EM algorithm, we use around uh, 20 patients and they are all from the FDG uptake. Right. And also the, the count level is almost the same because every patient about three minutes and, uh, and uh, currently we do not uh, have the issue of the variability. And uh, and all, all, also when they uh, you are you are right. There are some uh, abilities of the the patient's uptake, and we schedule it to uh, we 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 first uh, ch uh, check all the patients' uptake. And for some ab uh, abnormal patient which has a very high uptake or low uptake, we did some scaling to put them to the similar range. I see. Okay. Then on, on the software side, so you're also on TensorFlow, so I saw your uh, custom module there. So it, it is the general philosophy there a little bit similar to the implementation from Christopher earlier? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I did not get, get it. Can you repeat? So you, you implement your projectors in CUDA and then you put them into TensorFlow as a, as a custom layer. So is that similar to what Christopher was doing before? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I think because the, the current, the, the TensorFlow, they provide you a uh, interface to write your own uh, CUDA code. So you can put it uh, uh, into the TensorFlow and define your forward and backward projection. And that's what I did when I implement the distant uh, driven uh, projector inside the TensorFlow. Okay. Great. Yeah, I also assume that's the same way of doing doing it. Okay. Great. Uh, any any other questions? All right, well, that's, that's wonderful. I think that those were uh, the four very, very interesting talks about this topic uh, with a different slant from what we have heard at various conferences. So many thanks for the four speakers uh, for doing this. It's uh, really great. Um, so I see we, we are slightly over the time, but uh, I guess we could have predicted that maybe. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, we're going to stop talking a bit about machine learning now, and uh, let me try and share my um, So, um, right, and, and talk a little bit about future activities that we have uh, scheduled um, of the, uh, sorry, the anyway, the formatting is a little bit off there. But, uh, so first of all, uh, we are uh, planning a fourth hackathon, e even while we haven't done the third one yet, um, which Matthias Erhard is uh, uh, volunteering to organize in Bath uh, because we spread our wings across the UK. Um, September 23 and 4, which will concentrate on implementing synergistic algorithms, uh, because we feel we don't really have any of them in any decent shape at the moment. Uh, and so we have to make some progress on that. Uh, so that will be mostly Petamar uh, exercise, but people CI uh, will come and we will see which bits of CIL can be used there uh, to, to help us. Uh, part of their regularizers and so on can help. So that's, uh, you'll, you'll get an announcement from this on the mailing list. I thought it's here already. Um, obviously, we have our two weekly developer TCONs, which 
sometimes are on the website, but usually uh, they then sometimes are in the Slack form, so maybe usually not, but anyway, uh, they are there. So feel all feel free to dial into those. Uh, then we have a uh, slightly wider community meeting. So obviously there is the MIC coming up, and at the MIC, uh, the users meeting, I believe, on the Thursday. Uh, yep. And uh, there was an email on that in the mailing list, so do have a look at that. Uh, and then you, you have heard in emails about a synergistic image reconstruction symposium, which will happen after the uh, MIC. And I have a slide on that in a minute. Uh, and then just also wanted to give you a warning that we will have a Siemens Petamar users meeting at UCL. And uh, we will likely contribute to the physics session on the 5th of February. Uh, probably with the serve demo and then just as part of the global users meeting, how well are we doing with the MMR data at the moment? Uh, so those are a few meetings coming up, but the, the big one really is the symposium. Uh, where the URL might change in the near future, but um, uh, that one will stay valid, obviously. So the uh, topic of this symposium is uh, wider than PetMR. Uh, so it wants to look at any uh, modality or, or multimodality data set where you have uh, sort of parametric image reconstruction in a way. Uh, so any, you can look at a normal image reconstruction as a single parameter per voxel, but you can in some cases extract more than one. So in PetMR you can Say, oh, I'm going to have a pet and an MR parameter, but you can generalize that to many other situations. Uh, for instance, multispectral CTs, a big uh, emphasis of CCPI, so they are uh, co organizers of this symposium, or dynamic data, uh, or uh, uh, where you do follow up studies and you say uh, reconstruct all of them at the same time. So, uh, a lot of the methods that we have. Uh, in any of these are actually transferable to the other cases. So we thought with these we could organize a scientific symposium on that, so two days, uh, covering both medical and industrial imaging. Uh, so that would be a symposium first, where there's uh, about 28 talks by invited speakers, and then there will also be a uh, possibility to submit posters. Um, and then followed all that, we'll have a two-day software hands-on training session uh, where we will use both uh, the SERP and CIL software. and we will have separate training sessions on those. And then also put them together to try and get you going on synergistic image reconstruction in practice. Uh, so the venue will be, uh, mo the symposium will be in Chester fairly close to Manchester, and the training session will be in Dallas-Ferry, um, and we will organize shuttles between Manchester to Chester and Chester to dallas and stuff like that to get people moving around. Uh, it's in a nice hotel, and uh, we think we'll have get, well, we're accommodating for about 100 people for the symposium and, and half that or something for the training session. Uh, I, this is a somewhat out of date list of speakers. To give you an idea, I can have a look at the website. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping sometime today, maybe, uh, or tomorrow, I'll send an email around to allow you to register that you can already go to the uh, website, I think I have it up. So the, the link is on the CCP PetMR website. Uh, so this will 
move to, to somewhere else, but the information is here and you can already uh, pre-register if you like, or register your interest and indicate if you want to submit a poster. But you, you will then later on have to uh, register again uh, with more information on the leader and so on. But obviously, uh, if, you, if you fill in this form, you first come first. So, um, with organizing committee, whatever. So, uh, clearly, it could be the, the hackathon on the end of September. It could be tended to give us material to then use in the training session. So, uh, any questions on that? Sorry. So, all, all very welcome. Oh, it will, uh, it will be free, so that's kind of cool. Uh, good. So Richard is kind of optimistic and he thinks we can, we can pull off uh, having machine learning by then. So <laughs> <that's all. laughs> Let's see. Um, okay. Great. So that's, those are the main future activities that we're planning right now. Reminder that I'm from something like March. Flagship uh, runs until May. Um, and we're Going to try and put in the renewal, but maybe not so much for this purpose. Any questions on future activities? No? Okay, then uh, I think uh, if people are still up for it, we could have a uh, relatively brief discussion or, or, or look at our long term plan. Um, yes or no? Can we do that? Say just for note, we can't go there cookies upstairs. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think uh, five to ten minutes or something, maybe not longer than that, and then we can have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Further later on during that time as well, but for, <laughs> for the people who are online. Uh, so we uh, we have our long-term plan there, which we'll have a look at in a second. Uh, but as Jasper already mentioned, we're quite interested to try and get a PET GPU projector into STIR somehow. And if it's in STIR, then it would be nearly automatically in STIR. And uh, we are looking at nifty pets, but there are other ones around haven't really settled on that yet. So if anybody is interested in contributing a GPU projector uh, with our help, that would be fantastic. Uh, at the moment, so it doesn't do any GPU stuff. Uh, there's also uh, some uh, initial initiatives to do a cross-validation with uh, Castor or pet infrastructure, so that would be Castor versus Spur, and in the same pet, ideally, uh, we can show that they give equivalent results, more or less, uh, but we can use data for one for the other. Uh, and then maybe it's possible to have a basic integration in serves that we can call Castor relevant routines, but most of it, the image manipulation side of Cylinder probably still sit in the spur side. In fact, when Castor works, he executes so essentially we could call and execute and do some stuff and then read it back in. Uh, I don't know, we, we probably won't be able to pull that one off by, by March. But, uh, anyway, if you're, if you're interested in helping with that, then of course it would be great. So, um, This is our long term plan part of the GitHub uh, repository. In the documentation folder, we do have issues and milestones as one well, which sort of give a bit more uh, detail on this. Uh, 
and it's all done too. Um, this is our list of what we were targeting for for version 2.1. Uh, so version in works by uh, updated minor numbers if we add features and updating major numbers if we uh, break compatibility. And sometimes we might intentionally break compatibility to <laughs> have a major new release. <laughs> but uh, well, ideally not, obviously. But so they, they are they are listed here as sort of main big chunks of features. Um, so I don't think we should be going through the wish list later on over here. Uh, but if we have a look at 2.1, so some of these things you have heard of before at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so uh, I don't know if we can give any timelines on these because that all depends on our external contributors but uh, they are not far off and even uh, for instance for the signal we could say well we uh, can't do the time of flight stuff yet or, or we can't do uh, you know, the, the, the view offset problems that that Palak had uh, maybe we can't include those but I think it would be good to uh, at least have some kind of release part of stir and therefore serve. The amount of modifications on the serve side, side should be really small to do this. But on the stir side, there is a, it's a huge group of us. Um, to be head on there, so I, I don't know, Nikos, if you if you want to comment on the nine, non time of flight scatter, if, uh, if that's uh, kind of timeline roughly. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on, on your comments, so just my group project to do what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm on. Right, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for that. No, no, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. You don't have too much to do. So, um, so um, I think the integration with the CIL bit at the, at the bottom here, I think Edo is, uh, that's, as far as I understand, in very good shape at the moment. Yeah, I was uh, testing uh, the MR reconstructions with most of our algorithms. I got in trouble with the complex stuff. So, uh, but yeah, so it's 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 getting it's getting more and more mature. I'd say. Okay. So. Uh, uh, by the way, I progressed on the same um, level, I started to reprogress the Conda build uh, because that would make uh, our life much easier when we want to use CIL, which is distributed on Conda and, and Surf. So I, I added CIL build to, 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 to the super build, but now if we want to do CT reconstruction and we want to have um, Astra, then we have to build Astra as well. So, I mean, if we, I, I'm trying to make the Conda build to be ready as soon as possible, say. Okay. So can you give it a, a, as a rough timeline on as soon as possible? <laughs> well, Q3. Uh, okay. Now I'm, I'm aiming at having it okay for for the symposium and maybe next um, uh, hackathon yeah I, I think what we can't do is aim for it to have it ready on the first of November and then use it in the training school or whatever, whatever that that's not going to work yet um, so I I would think yes by end of September at the latest. Yes, yeah, I mean, for the hackathon, it, w it would be good to test it, actually. So, okay, then the other things there, uh, I, I mentioned the bed position stuff. 
Um, I'm not optimistic that we're going to be able to do that by you know Q3 uh, because I don't think that largely depends on Ashley. Yeah, and he doesn't have time, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the two MR items, they crucially depend on uh, having a, a gadget from Chilins as XMLs. Yeah. So if, if, there's, if somebody can find me a gadget from Chilin that has iterative reconstruction and that 3D sequences, then based on that, uh, I don't think it, it, it will take, take much time to implement. Uh, uh, although 3D Cartesian, you mean 3D FFT, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, the, well, we, we still uh, are sort of married to FFT double, right? So it's a separate, separate issue. Right? Well, so we, we are, to be solved. we are now, but we need to look away with it. Sure, sure. But, uh, since gadget one part is FFT double, they should have uh, 3D effective. Uh, yeah, obviously, so, yes. So I'm just, I'm just um, clarifying. So, for, so uh, as soon as I have uh, two gadget chains for these two items, it, it should be nice to get there. So, well, okay. So I don't, I don't think. Sadly, we are able to use a gadget as as you well know for the acquisition modeling. You have to steal the code and right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But once I have uh, the, the chain, I will see how to use that gadget, right. which will do the job. And then I, I will reverse engineer and so on. But without the chain, right. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't think we have too many MR people on, online at the moment, uh, or at least MR people who do know gadget. So you need to, to take the initiative of other people, <laughs> which is going to be hard dealing with something. But, uh, 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 so um, my feeling in any case is that we will want to split all these items up over different releases. Uh, we're not going to wait until everything is finished and then call it sequence one. I think we want to have a uh, actually 2.0.1 fairly soon. I don't know why we wouldn't. And then uh, whenever we have one of those things kicked off, we, we have another release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to waiting to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons there is that uh, at some point we'll get our hopefully reviews of the paper back and by that time we'll do a three billion of paper Also the one that was Nicholas will say it can take ages. Yeah, it can take up maybe a year. That, that's a lot of good work time of life. At least the, the thing is that they start they delay their start. I think uh, never went to the exactly. So no. it was a different story. Because this one, they really want to take the issue quickly. So I, I bet that they will come keep very fast to do Yeah, I, I think we. I'm assuming they'll be quite easy. Mm -hmm. Just because they want to get all the computers yeah. within that. Uh, so yeah, we use the strategy to submit that as late as possible, and therefore we need to use the Who knows? Uh, well, anyway, uh, so there are there are. Okay, I think more or less saying whatever we can do here, uh, let's kill them off one by one as as we use, and not have one big chunk. Uh, which is why it's called sort of group and fun, etc. there anything on this list that's missing that we think we can include? <laughs> uh, we have the detectors. Uh, detector blocks is uh, that's uh, the, the, the point here is that uh, we may need 
an adaptation in the most recent version, so to speak, which is you know, something that uh, Elizabeth has expressed uh, willingness in developing, even integrating in, or doing checks with the time of flight aspects, particularly because their scanner is 200 picoseconds. So since she can actually test the time of flight elements on that as well, and also uh, anything else that we, we have that is relevant, like J, um, mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. So if, uh, if we want, we have to see that the feedback here will be from the next. So yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. This is the yeah. yeah. these options. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, well, okay, I don't think we'll be able to pull that one up by uh, Q3. No, no, <laughs> but, but if we meet the Q3, then maybe Q1 uh, next year would be an opportunity. Right, sure. Okay, um, so I think, yeah, so time of flight, I did put still there because I, uh, if we, Put scatter and time of flight and whatever. And there is, there is one thing I think I want you about. I think that the time of flight branch uh, might have a problem with the uh, uh, HDA5 code. Yeah. We have to tap on that. Yeah. Sure. We have to be very careful that we do it. We also have a break of the code, it doesn't work. The tilt angle uh, with time of flight, unfortunately, does work, so it needs to be a little bit more really aware by Balak. That's uh, something we left for um, weeks to come. So everything worked, she did it nice. Now we are a little bit one step. Yeah. Well, it doesn't put compiling problems with the time of flight code. So, but I, I just, just to warn you, that unfortunately, this extra bit is. All right. Uh, somebody online, I'm not sure who needs to mute, please. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, so I think. That's more or less where I wanted to have the discussion on. Uh, just to remind people, these are these are our targets here. Um, so, uh, is there any other business that anybody wants to raise? No. If not, uh, I, I wanted to remind everybody: we still have a lot of money to fund your travel to the UK or from the UK or within the UK. Uh, I certainly can't fund uh, travel from Germany to Sweden, <laughs> but if you pass by uh, the UK, maybe I can. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of money, you know, so uh, please do apply for this and we, this, the process is really simple, it is on the website. Um, and if you have any seminars or so that you want to uh, have people uh, listening in remotely, uh, please contact Edo. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. Thank you all for uh, the contributions and especially our uh, three remote external speakers and Castor for the very interesting presentations. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, uh, Casper used uh, um, Jupyter Notebook as a presentation medium. Is that true? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, can you let me know how you did it? <laughs> sure, yeah, with a whole bunch of um, add ons, but yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Okay. Uh, let's close the meeting then. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Christopher, also for the slides. Yeah. You got it? Okay, that's fine, because I got a lot of rejects from the mailing list. <laughs> not for me, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bye-bye.
Bye. Bye. I love that I can have to say how you stuff to Yeah, no. I mean, it sounds like a fun. I just typed reversible neural network and the Google found the paper.